So I just had a very interesting, a very great conversation with one Nicholas Obregón. And uh, he's a very talented writer. He's a novelist. And he also created the Faceless podcast, which delves deep, a seven-part series about the Setagaya murders of the Miyazawa family. And I would consider him pretty much the authority on this case. And he was kind enough to sit down with me and actually have like a, a talk about the case. So I started gathering all the questions I could from the YouTube channel. So we jumped off with questions from you guys on the previous Set of Guy video that I made here. And it led into this plethora of great information from Nick as well as, well, for this video, he shared with me some images from the actual crime scene that I personally could not find on my own and I'm thinking a majority of the public has never ever seen and I'm just gonna warn you guys ahead of times they can be very graphic and the TPMD the Tokyo Metropolitan Police they did doctor it you know because they do that with majority of their things and I think I'm gonna have to doctor it even a little more for YouTube's sake but regardless when when I saw these pictures it made it made things so much real you 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 could feel the pain when you see you know the position that ray was in the position that nina and yasuko was in mikio and it yeah i could see why nick is obsessed with this case because he was boots on the ground and he is second to none in terms of being authority on this case and I just want to take this time to say thank you to him again and hey if you guys can please in the comment section below before we begin this video just leave Nick a thank you too for sharing his time and his information with us it's it's a great interview guys and uh, he is well spoken he has a great Madridian accent I think all the way from Spain he was talking to us but our connection was perfect so the interview went great I want to thank Nick personally and uh, well let's go ahead and get this interview going i'm gonna go into my little youtube true crime shed right now and uh, start the halloween video that i've been planning so bye bye enjoy the interview hey hey man how's it going let's see if we're delayed at, at anything all the way from spain huh all the way from spain man yeah i used to live in california but back to europe now oh why why'd you leave us is it because yeah. of the killer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. You know, international man of mystery. I have to move around. You know what I mean? I was yeah. a I was a California guy for a minute. Yeah, around the LA area. I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. I was in. I was. Well, I was living downtown LA for a while. As deep into the weeds as you are with this case, yeah. Maybe, maybe I could understand why you keep it moving. Yeah. You know? Yeah, man. And uh, well, of course, you know the the point occurs to you whilst you're making a podcast about a murderer. If he's still out there. Maybe he Googles himself, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Maybe he knows my name. Mm -hmm. Well, he definitely knows your name. <laughs> He's out there. I think you are the biggest podcast yeah. for, for this particular uh, case there is. So, well, let's go ahead and introduce yourself. I have with me Nicholas Obregon. Is that good enough? <laughs> you got it. You got it. A pleasure to be with you, sir. Yes. And um, you are an author. Would you consider yourself a, well, a novelist, right? So would you consider yourself a crime novelist or maybe that's just the, the subjects you like the most? Um, I'll be honest with you, man. Like when I was a kid, I just wanted to write books. It wasn't really like a detective novel plan. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I came across this case, uh, the Miyazawa family, I realized that I wanted to write a book about them but it was going to be a non-fiction book to begin with. And then I realized I didn't have any Japanese. I had zero resources. So it kind of ended up being a novel. That was just like in my spare time. And But then I got an agent and then it got published and then my life changed and now I'm an author. So I kind of like a, a crime novelist kind of by accident. But I do, I, I love the genre. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe one day I'll end up writing romance or something like, I write <laughs> <laughs> yeah we won't pigeonhole you to any genre <laughs> right so um yeah but i've started the uh, blue light yokohama i'm telling you that first the prelude is 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 already captivating me so far it's a great book i i recommend anybody i got it on audible i recommend anybody trying to check out blue light yokohama by nicholas obragon 
<laughs> You're a great man. I, I did not pay him to say that. Just say that. No, no, no money's exchanged hands. <laughs> I'm still broke, so we're all good here. So. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the podcast, Faceless, right? Mm -hmm. Um uh, you said yourself that you just went obsessive mode on this case. Yeah, man. So essentially, I first come across this case just casually, I think in like 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. um, first time I go to Japan, which is wild because even by then, it was already a decade unsolved. Right. Um, and now we're 15 years down the track from from that. So I would say around 2009, 2010, I first read about it. I was just jet lagged in a hotel, I couldn't sleep. I ended up going to this empty house, which when you're jet lagged, you're like, yeah, what else am I doing? And then I stood there and it kind of, it, it felt, it, it got real to me. Um, and it just, it got under my skin and it, and it never crawled out. So years later, like I say, uh, 2014, about that time, I kind of started to take writing a book seriously. And, uh, and I ended up in Soshigaya Park and I ended up with a kind of a fictionalized version of this case. So obviously in my book, it goes in a different direction, but jumping off point is a whole family murdered for seemingly no reason. And I think that's the heart of this case is, the okay, we have the what, but the why is still a question mark. So um, like you say, around lockdown, um, I was in between books and it had always been a bit weird to me that I'd kind of taken a real thing and turned it into a fictional novel, which kind of like is what all novels are on some level. But I don't know, man, these are real people. Those are real kids. And and I had come to them initially through nonfiction. And I knew I wanted to go back and explore um, the, the real side of this. So then that's when I pitched a true crime podcast to my agent um, in the middle of lockdown, which is not great timing, but we ended up uh, where we ended up. And it was really nice for me personally to be able to actually knock on doors and, and make phone calls kind of on their behalf, at least as an attempt, if not to solve this, to bring it to a wider audience. Because like you've noticed in Japan, everybody knows about it, but uh, in, in the English speaking world, not so many people, I mean, you know, obviously in the crime realm they do, but your average Joe, maybe not, which is wild to me because this case um, feels like it would be one of those emblematic cases, you know, Zodiac, um, John Benet Ramsey, Jack the Ripper, whatever. To me, it feels like it should be up there um, and known by everyone because this guy, he's out there. Okay. And um, that's the Faceless Podcast. And uh, it's an award-winning podcast. So uh, I want to add that for you. And um, a lot of the people that have watched my video have listened to the Faceless Podcast and they've been fans for years. I've screenshot something for you. I just recently got a little bit of flowers for you uh, from a comment section the man is at grudeman408 says that he's been obsessed with this case since 2015 and uh, a little stuff for about me and then he went on to go and say that he's listened to the faceless podcast literally 15 times so wow. i've also recommended it to many people not so much a question he did because i asked him if he had a question for you but he doesn't have a question uh he just wanted to say thank you to you and the production quality and level of detail was astounding thanks dude i appreciate that Greenman. thanks dude it's 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 a wonderful podcast i couldn't stop listening to it and uh i felt i felt like i was um uh, immersed in that situation i mean in terms of being an authority on this case i would consider you an authority on this case i mean um who would you put above you as as probably delving into more thoroughly i mean besides the detective right sushida yeah i mean yeah like i don't want it to sound like an arrogant thing I'm, you won't I you simply, won't <laughs> i just i don't think look at least in the english speaking world i don't think there is anyone that what i would say is that um, like when we spoke off air, I would say pretty much like, if not 100%, 99% of the content or stories that are told about this case get stuff wrong. Um, I did that too before I actually did this podcast and kind of fully investigated it sort of professionally, right? Um, the difference is with, with the investigation that I made is I, I actually went to, to, to the horse's mouth. You know, I actually spoke to the people involved, both in the family, um, where that was possible and uh, 
and within the um, law enforcement. So the 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 pleasure for me was to be actually to be able to dispel some of the rumors, to be able to say, listen, I've read a thousand times online that X, Y, Z, is that true? And to have them say that's not true or yes, that is true. So who else has done that? I, I don't think um, anyone to my knowledge, and if I'm forgetting someone, I apologize. Um, but also like it stands to reason, man, like most people in the crime, in the true crime community, um, you make a case, you move on to the next one because that's the nature of the beast. For me, man, th this was never, this was never something that I wanted to do. Um, it was this one event, this one family that got under my skin. I'm not really interested in other cases. I'm not interested in Monster of the Week. To me, this is, I don't want to say my life's work, but certainly it's become an obsession. Um, and it's been under my skin since, yeah, 2009, 2010, you know, like when I first started writing my book, I had a picture of that family on my desk. Um, I, I was not interested in sensationalizing what happened to them. I was not interested in uh, the blood and the guts. I don't want to name names, but there are podcasts out there that really delve into that kind of pornographic side of it. I mm -hmm. fucking, I, I hate that, man. Um, you know, I, for me, it's, these were real people, which deserves respect, number one. It's not just another video. It's not just another episode. And the guy who did this to them is out there. So we know the what. So now we have to go for the why, which is part of the reason of what your video chimed with me was the, okay, we know what's happened. Now let's look forward. And that chimed with me, man, because that's that's where we are. That's where we have to be. Yes. And I and I and I mean everything I said. This this case feels warm. It's very it's 24 years old, but it does feel warm. Like we're just on the verge. And which is also very scary because if the perpetrator starts to feel boxed in, uh, mm. uh yeah. I'd, I'd rather be in Spain right now too, I right, would say. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hoping the flight to Spain is maybe a bit too long for him, you know, so. When we, um, I guess, quickly brainstormed it a bit, might be a might be a debunking video, but I'm assuming also uh, we're going to probably just naturally gravitate towards other bits and pieces of this <laughs> story. But I can go ahead and ask you some questions uh, sure. from the viewers. And this gentleman has a lot. He is at... <laughs> ally and he's really invested in the case and he has tons of questions for you okay okay so the first question any new updates i heard they're planning to use dna genealogy right um any new updates so okay there are there are two answers to that the first and kind of most obvious answer is um no there are zero updates mm -hmm. um or if uh any discoveries have been made then the tmpd hasn't made them public um, and I do think it's entirely possible that maybe they do know a lot of things that they're not sharing. That's something that we've seen uh, the TMPD do before. Obviously, that happens um, in Europe, in the US as, as well. Uh, but certainly they haven't shared those things. Um, in terms of updates beyond the actual black and white case, um, it does seem that there is a growing willingness to send maybe younger police personnel um, abroad to learn new forensic techniques. Um, and I think, look, up top, it's important for me to say that um, I'm not what you would call pro-police, um, but I have seen the way that the TMPD um, work, right? And I've seen it close up. And I'm not saying they're a perfect institution. Um, and also there are inherent problems with the Japanese legal system as a whole. But what I would say that cannot be questioned um, is the effort that they put into this and okay. the resources that they they have, man. So there are a lot of comments um, that have kind of suggested that because they can't do DNA uh, investigations for various reasons, um, that somehow is kind of evidence of them not being up to speed or them being kind of backwards or whatever it mm -hmm. is. Um, the reality is with that DNA and with the genealogy to, to answer um, Ally's question, um, that they don't have a, an existing legal framework in Japan to be able to investigate DNA. Right, so so what they do is when they find a killer's DNA at a crime scene, they go to their uh, DNA database of offenders and they match it one to one. If the killer is on the database, great, it pops. They know who did it. If he or she is not on that database, that's where DNA um, gets dropped. Basically, um, there are a few reasons for this. Um, partly, privacy is is sacred um, in Japan. 
um, there's not a big willingness to give a police force, which already has pretty much more pol powers than any other police force on earth. There's not a lot of willingness to give them yet more. Um, I'll give you an example. Like if you get in a, in a bar fight in Japan, you punch a guy and a glass breaks, they can hold you for 23 days for the violence and then they can hold you for another 23 days for the criminal damage, right? So if you're in a room for 50 days, you're going to confess to it, right? So they have a lot of power um, in Japan and I'm not sure there's a huge appetite to kind of give them more. We'll probably touch on DNA a bit more um, later on. And just to finish with that question, um, one thing that I do think is important to reference is on the one hand, while there are no tacit um, developments with the case, there was um, some news earlier this year where the local council in Setagaya um, passed a motion. So there was a vote held, the vote won, and that vote was to try and um, convince the overall government to move ahead with changes to these DNA laws in order to try and uh, make a breakthrough with this with this case. So look, that's positive. Um, mm -hmm. But as Ryushi, who's my writing partner, partner and, uh, and uh, producer, Faceless, as he says, you know, change in Japan is glacial, right? It takes a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's positive change. We don't know how long it's going to take. So look, broad, broad notes, yes and no, right? It's leaning more right. towards no, but it's not a completely closed door. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Okay. Uh, Ally also wanted to know, why did he kill the rest of the family? I guess he's assuming that he was there to kill maybe one member. Right, Ray right. in the beginning, and then he just stayed and killed the rest. Um, I guess that is... Well, he would go on to say, weird how the mother and daughter didn't see him. Right, so he's assuming that either Ray or Mikio were the, were the kind of true targets, I guess. Right. Um, the answer to that is we, we simply don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and and look, you know, we don't know is going to be the answer to a lot of questions that, that mm -hmm. we're going to have uh, tonight which I know is disappointing because it feels kind of like a non-answer, but actually that is important because, um, look, after 15 years of, of following and investigating this case, I've seen countless people suggest that we do know things um, when we absolutely do not know those things. Um, so to look, to answer that that user um, or that viewer, the, 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 the premise of his question uh, suggests that we know if the killer had one target uh, and we do not. Um, the ultimate outcome is that the whole family died. Um, and so until we understand more about his motives, I think it's kind of logical to assume that the outcome was his intention, what was his goal, mm. which is crazy, obviously, to us um, to think that his goal would be to slaughter um, a whole family. But, you know, the, the, the result is the result. Um, in terms of Yasuko and Nina seeing him, we don't know that they did or, or, or they didn't. Um, I mean, look, to be sure, they probably did see him because he stabs them twice, um, first up in the attic. He goes up the ladder, stabs them in the attic. Um, but that knife is already broken in Mikio's skull. So it does a lot of damage to them, but it's not killing them, I guess. So he aborts the attack at that point, goes back downstairs. And at that point, um, Yasuko carries Nina down the ladder. And when she gets to the bottom of the ladder, it seems as if she runs out of um, energy um, and that, that's when, and because because mm. the kid, Nina, then goes to the bathroom to get the first aid kit. And as she's coming back, that's when the killer returns now with with a carving knife. Um, so look, they did see him. If the user means they didn't see him whilst they're upstairs, we don't know that because maybe they didn't see him, but they would have heard Mikio shouting, right? Or what, what the hell are you doing in my house? Or get off me or screaming or whatever. Maybe they looked through the gap and saw him. We simply don't know. So that's kind of the paradox of this case, man, is that we know so much, but yet despite that, there are so many remaining question marks, um, which I think is part of the nature why it got under my skin. Yeah. And uh, in in the research, I did touch upon that, yeah, they should have been screaming. And right. why didn't anybody hear them? I mean, maybe just nobody was in the vicinity. Maybe everybody was sound asleep, mm. right? Um, I guess that is the paradox of the whole right. thing. And well, Ally would continue to ask if he didn't expect to kill all four and it was an inexperienced killer's taste for murder. It's mm. weird why he would stay so long and act like he was at home. Right. I mean, look, the. So what the killer was expecting, again, we, we, we simply don't know if 
if the result was exactly what he wanted or maybe it kind of it happened he lost control of it and then before he knew it he was four murders deep right so we simply don't know um to to me um and we'll probably get onto this a bit m more later but to me i think he went there with the intention of killing at least one person now it's a family home it's late at night you would have to be a, re a real idiot to not assume that they're at home. Mm -hmm. So how you would imagine you can kill one person without alerting anybody else in a small house doesn't really make sense. So I think the most logical assumption is he went there with the intention of destroying them. That was the outcome, and we don't really have anything to point away from it. Um, so, But let's pretend he went there to rob them, right, and it went wrong. Um, to me, I find that among the less likely arguments. Um you know, we spoke about this in my podcast. I speak to experts who kind of specialize in criminality within robbery and the rest of it. They all said the same thing. It's not a robbery. You know, number one, why would he come to a house at a time when he knows the people are going to be there? Right. The lights are on. It's stupid. Um, number two, why, if he wanted the money, um, would he immediately just murder a sleeping child? Right. If you're a robber, you don't immediately kill a small kid. Um, number three, why would you hang around afterwards? Right. Exactly. Number four, if you are there to rob them, why do you only take some of the money, but not the rest of it, which is actually a larger quantity, which was actually on the computer, which he used. So it's not like he didn't see it, right? I th it was in his eye line. So I think he kind of at the last minute grabs a bit of cash. Maybe I'll make it look like a robbery. Um, and then lastly, if he is a robber, there's jewelry there, right? There's um, valuables. You know, there's all kinds of things in the house that he's not um, interested in. Ultimately, this guy comes wearing gloves. He covers his face. We know this because the handkerchief is one of the, he has two. One is pinched at the front as if he had it around his nose. Um, he's got the low brim hat and he has a large knife in his, in his bag, which he uses to murder this family. So if you're there to rob them, then why do you come with a kill kit? Why mm -hmm. do you murder small children? You know, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really follow to me. So yeah, I think look, his expectations, I think his expectations were to 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 murder them. And in terms of what he thought would happen versus did happen, look, the, the TMPD say he's anywhere between 15 uh years of age and 24 on the night of the murders. So if he is 15, that's crazy young. Okay. So if he's that crazy young, um, then we have to look at that, right? So what? He's never committed a crime up until the age of 15 and then one fine night he murders a whole family that seems like a jump it's possible but he's not on any lists anywhere he's never been in in a youth offender uh, institution he's never been in a mental health facility nobody knows of him it it doesn't really it doesn't really track for me in terms of what the user says about hanging out at the house um that was one of the initial things that I think kind of freaked me out and freaks everyone out when they hear about this case, because it does give it that kind of creepy quality. Um, but I think when you peel it back, there could be reasons. Um, I think once he realizes quite quickly that the police aren't on their way, um, we know that he's hurt. We know that he's lost a fair amount of blood. Um, maybe he, he can't physically leave easily. Maybe he needs that rest. Maybe um, he's working with the time frame. If he's 15, maybe he's on a curfew and he has to wait till 5 a.m., let's say. And he figures the police haven't come. I'm bleeding. I have to clean this up. Maybe he figures it's not a great option, but, you know, he's lost a lot of blood. Maybe he's not thinking straight. He figures I'll just stay here. Um, what he expects and what happens, maybe there's a disconnect. Maybe it's exactly as it went. Um, but the idea that, like, you know, we're dealing with this movie kind of like Hannibal Lecter character. I'm not sure I buy that. I, I think we'll, we'll get into this later on, but I think it's he went there to kill them and then it turned out to be harder than he thought it would be. And that probably pissed him off, um, which is maybe what leads into that into that violence. Yeah, that sounds perfectly plausible the way you put it that way. Um, also, he would like to know about the documents in the toilet and the bathtub. Do you know if it's possibly a cover-up, maybe maybe those documents had something more important on them than than not. Um, so basically, um, okay. So the 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 the, the documents them, themselves, right? Um, yes. This is often spoken about because I think people kind of are attracted. 
that they're attracted to this detail because I think it kind of hints towards motive, right? Or it hints to a kind of greater narrative. Um, now, look, I can't rule out that the killer was covering something up and that they had to die because they had some document in their house that, you know, would threaten him in, in some way. So I can't rule it out. Um, but what I would say is that kind of feels kind of more cinematic to me um, in the sense that you have to remember that it's been 24 years and the Tokyo MPD have put more than 280,000 personnel on this case, which is the population of Reno, Nevada. So if you imagine an entire city of cops, and bearing in mind the standard to reach a detective in Tokyo is way higher than it is in many other places on Earth. And we know the hours that they work in Japan. I've seen it. They work long hours, they work hard, and they're clever, right? You ask anybody who's dealt with these people, they'll tell you they don't mess around, right? I'm not saying that the TMPD as a whole is a perfect institution, but those homicide detectives are not stupid, right? And they've worked this hard, and a quarter of a million of them plus across 24 years, and they cannot come up with one single shred that nods towards a cover-up. The, the cover-up idea suggests a connection between the family and the killer. And there's simply a zero evidence of that. Zero. So again, I'm not saying it's it doesn't exist. I'm not saying that there is no connection. What I'm saying is we have zero evidence of it. And you would think after everything I've just said, there would be kind of a hint of it, right? So, um, so that's the reality. You would imagine that if there was some kind of link, um, if someone's going to suggest that, my next question would be, okay, what? Right. If, if whilst we're spitballing, what would that link be? And and then things get very thin very quickly, right? Um, lots of people have suggested maybe Yasuko, um, because she was a teacher, maybe there was some kind of link there. Again, the TMPD are not stupid, right? They know she runs a cram school from her house. I mean, bearing in mind she was dealing with younger kids, right? So right there, that doesn't really fit. But let's pretend she was dealing with teenage boys. It's 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 wholly imaginable that the TMPD would have gone to the local high schools next day. Who's got injuries on their hands? Who has a weird alibi yesterday, right? Teachers, who are your problem kids? Do you have anyone violent in class, right? Zero, 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 zero. So either he knows them, and my feeling is if he knew them, the police would have found that because the second they realize, okay, this killer is in the wind, now they look at the family, they do the victimology. They, they really dig into their lives, right? Affairs, money owed, uh, problems, grudges, they find zero. So I'm not saying there is no link. What I'm saying is that seems to me that there is not one, because if there was one, I think that kind of would be out there. It's possible they found one and they're hiding it, but it's been 24 years and I don't think the TMPD would still be biding their time, right? Right. <laughs> Exactly. Now, that would actually lead into Mikio's line of work, which mm. would probably not lead to any type of grudge in that manner in terms of, a, I don't know, a, a corruption in his corporation, in his company. Which yeah, was... correct. Um, we know that the, the colleagues are interviewed extensively. And when I made Faceless, I approached uh, the company Interbrand. I spoke with the CEO back and forth quite a bit. And... Um, he, he said, yeah, look, there are still people here who knew Mikio, right? They're still here. And they were interviewed extensively. And he said, I'm going to ask them, but I can't promise you anything. And kind of he went over it with them. And in the end, they said no. Well, what he actually said was uh, he, they are very negative to talk about it. Hmm. So, you know, and, and I can't blame them, right? But, but look, if the TMPD would have looked at any possible... You know, who's the guy he doesn't like in the office? Who's the guy who got passed over for the promotion instead of Mikio, right? They would have looked at these things and they found zero. In terms of the work he was doing, um, you know, it, it it doesn't sound like anything close to um, what would get someone murdered for some kind of corporate espionage thing. We know that he was involved in the project to coin the phrase Wi-Fi, that kind of marketing project. He was involved in that. Mikio was basically an artist. He was basically a designer. He worked on the Inspector Gadget series as an animator, I believe, um, you know, sort of in the 80s, 90s. He was involved in a puppet group. And we know that he was designing airplane liveries, which is basically the design of an airplane outside, right? The, the paint job. So that's kind of what he was doing at work. It, it doesn't suggest anywhere that someone would 
you know, come in and murders two small children and his wife and him with a sushi knife based on some kind of corporate es espionage. I can't deny it 100%. It just doesn't make sense from the outside, right? Right. Now, now from everything that you've gathered about uh, Mikio and Yasuko, mm. in terms of their personality, is, is there any leaning towards maybe being more meek, maybe a little bit more right. out, outspoken? I mean, uh, right. yeah, let's talk about Mikio first. Um, is there any okay. gauge of his personality? Well, look, w with Mikio, it, th this is complicated by the fact that most people who knew him personally didn't want to talk to me. Mm. Um, which for those of you who kind of have been to Japan or kind of dealt with, um, you know, the way things work over there, that's maybe not super surprising. But, um, you know, we, we did speak to his mother. We did speak to, to to people who had dealt with this case before. You hear different things. It, it sounds as if, look, basically he was a family man who loved his kids and who was into the things he was into, like theatre and puppetry and animation, like I say. Um, and, and, and it's by all accounts, he was a very meticulous man who kept very detailed uh, account books, right, at home. Everything they spent went into his book. Um, it sounds as if he was a kind of a financially shrewd man, um, didn't spend a lot maybe. Um, but for example, if we take the account of the house sale, that was originally a 200 unit housing complex in Soshigaya Park. By the time of the murders, the city, which was redeveloping the land, had bought out 196 other houses. There's only four left, including Mikio um, and including Anne Irie, which is his sister-in-law and that side of the family who lived right next door. He was holding on to that sale for as long as possible, maybe to bump up the price or maybe because he wanted his kids to stay in the same catchment area so that they'd be in the same school together because we know that the older sister looked after the boy who had some developmental difficulties on the other side of it we we it seems as if maybe he wasn't the easiest guy to work with there is some suggestion that he would kind of dig his heels in there's a suggestion that they tried to move him across departments within the within the within the company he said no this is my job i'm staying which is not a typical thing in japan to tell your boss no right mm -hmm. um there's some suggestion that if he didn't like something he would say it we also know from certain accounts that, um, you know, he wasn't, uh, it wasn't beyond him to open the door and tell people to keep it down if they were take, making too much noise. Now, look, from the outside, some people might go, hmm, that doesn't sound very Japanese. He must have been really... There are a lot of stereotypes about Japanese people. I've spent a lot of time there. There's 127 million people. There's all kinds, right? Some people will tell you to shut up. Some people will keep their, keep their own counsel. So I'm not sure what we can draw out of that, but... Um, it would make sense that the more people you ask, the more different versions of him you get. Right. The most common kind of vision of him is a family man um, who did not have enemies and who did not have this coming to him. Right. And Yasuko, probably the same, right? Not much to gauge on. Yeah, her her less so because... Um, so Setsuko Miyazawa, who was uh, Mikio's mother, she didn't want to talk about that side of the family very much. She wouldn't really get into that. Um also bearing in mind she's 94 years old and this was done through a translator. So it wasn't like super fluid, right? And I didn't want to, I didn't want, you know, she's an old lady who's gone through a lot, you know, more than many of us could imagine. I didn't want to sort of grill her and be like, give me an answer, you know. Right. But, um, but from everything that um, was said about Yasuko, you know, she, she's a smart woman, she was a teacher, she loved her kids um, and maybe not as a kind of colorful a character as Mikio might have been. Just one example, aside from like the puppetry and, and all of that, uh, Mikio owned uh, a Citroen Xanthia uh, and it was red. So to own a French kind of family SUV uh, in the late 90s, uh, a, a red one, no less, was kind of a weird choice. Um, now it's kind of more common to see cars of other colors, you know, I'm not saying it's completely nuts, but um, certainly back when I was first there, cars are like grey, white, you know, navy. That's kind of it. So for him to own like a red French car maybe is not the most common thing. So he certainly had like certain parts of his personality where he was, I don't want to say eccentric, but but you know what I'm saying. Um, I'm not sure Yasuko shared that. Um, I feel like she was kind of more straight laced. That's completely me just reading into it. I obviously never met her, but that's the vibe I get. 
Okay. He also asks, has any other countries tried to do the DNA sampling genealogy to find the killer? Um, so basically, um, look, that, that wouldn't be legal, basically. Um, this case happened in, in Japan, right? Um, and so the minute the police start investigating outside of their own law, if they were to catch the guy, that would completely compromise the conviction. Um, so that's not to say they can't ask for a second opinion, right? Uh, we know that um, they did ask for second opinions. Um, I mean, we'll probably get more into DNA specifically later on, but we know that they did do that. Um, so they can for sure ask for second opinions and the rest of it. But there are inherent problems with DNA in Japan. So number one, like I say, there isn't a legal framework to do it. So right there, that kills it. Um, but even let's say if it changed tomorrow and let's say if tomorrow they passed a new law and said, okay, from now on, you can catch this guy in the same way that, you know, the Golden State Killer was caught. Okay, well, there is no, there is no big, um, you know, DNA database in Japan because it's useless. Uh, in America, right, you have people from all over the place. Um, you know, everybody's grandparents are from somewhere, right, unless they're Native Americans. Um, you add into the fact lots of people, let's say if they're, they're you know, um, ancestors came through to America um, sort of under duress in the slave trade, they might not know um, where those roots are. So something like 23andMe, um, you know, GEDmatch, all of these things make sense, right? People want to know where they're from. Japan is the least genetically diverse place on earth, pretty much, you know, that people know where they're from. So these databases, even if you change the law, they're, they're not there. So it wouldn't even be as simple as, um, you know, clicking your fingers and making a new law. This is all assuming, of course, that the killer's DNA um, would be found within Japan. If the killer is foreign, which is a possibility, that's a different matter. There it becomes more complicated. Um, we know that the TMPD have shared his fingerprints with Interpol, um, but for anybody who doesn't know, Interpol isn't like some kind of international FBI. It's essentially an information sharing system so that the police forces of the world, they you know can put a red notice on your name and wherever you turn up at an airport or a police station or whatever, if you have a red notice out, you'll ping and then wherever you're wanted back home, you know, they're going to get a notification. So this killer's fingerprints are on that, all right? So that's kind of a, to my knowledge, that's as far as Japan goes or the TMPD goes outside of their borders to try and find him. That's it. But that's assuming that number one, he's going to get arrested somewhere. And it's also assuming that I don't know, let's say if he gets pulled over for speeding in, in you know, rural Arkansas, d d does the red notice ping then if the local sheriff pulls him over? I don't know how it works. So <laughs> that's kind of as far as that's gone. But to broadly answer the question, no, it would have to be within Japan, but it cannot be within Japan. So it's kind of like a catch-22. Okay. So is there anything special about that folder the killer created? The, the, the folder itself that he creates, I mean, the, the broad answer is no. So far as I know, there isn't. But it's an interesting question um, because he does indeed go on Mikio's computer after the family is dead and for a period of five minutes, 1.18 a.m. to 1.23 a.m. That's the only timestamp we have in these murders. It's the only time frame we are certain about. Now, we know that at 10.38 p.m., Mikio opens a work email using his password. So it seems to be very likely that they're still alive at that point. Um, and then we know that the family next door, which is Anne Edie, so she's Yasuko's sister and Mikio's sister-in-law. Someone in their family at about 11 o'clock hears a bang, a loud kind of thud or a bang, which sounds wooden in nature. Later on, the TMPD do um, recreations, they do experiments, and it turns out to be the attic ladder, the pull-down ladder. So. Mikio and Yasuko stayed up there in the in the attic bedroom. That was their room. And Nina and Yasuko were up there on the night of the murders. It seems to be that after they're dead, after everyone's dead, he throws the ladder back up because there's nobody up there and the ladder would just be in his way in the middle of the hallway. So he tosses it back up. There's a loud bang. So there's a 20 minute window for the murders. And then at 1.18 a.m. he logs onto the computer for a period of five minutes. The only thing we know that he does is to create a new folder. So anything, anybody watching this video, when you read about this case and it says he tried to buy tickets or he tried to buy a flight or he tried to do this, that and the other on Mikio's favorites bar, 
I don't, I don't want to say it's BS, but I'm saying it's unsubstantiated. That's based on nothing, right? It's possible that happened, but we do not know that it happened, right? What is significant is that it gives us a time frame. So he is in that house, minimum, right? From sometime before 11 p.m. and 1.23 a.m., right? Two, three hours, right? Which is still a long time to be in that house. It's possible at 1.24 a.m., right there, he walks out. Anything that you read about the second connection in the morning, that was Haruko, the grandmother, which is Yasuko's mother and Anirie's mother. That was her coming in, knocking the mouse with her arm. Right? I don't know if she faints or something when she sees uh, Mikio's body, but that was her accidentally waking the computer up in the morning, not the killer. So right. he could have left the, right there at 124. We don't know. He could have left at 9 a.m. I don't think it's likely. I think he leaves under darkness, but there we go. So that's the only definitive start timestamp. The reason, though, it's interesting as well is that he only creates a new folder, doesn't seemingly do anything with it, might have done it by accident, but he is on the computer for five minutes, which seems like kind of a long time mm -hmm. to just make a new folder. So again, it is possible he did other stuff and the TMPD haven't said, or it could have taken four minutes to boot up, you know, 24 years ago, and or maybe he was just kind of moving them. We don't know, basically, is, is the short answer to that. Okay. And I also saw, and maybe is on that Reddit thread, that only the mouse was used. Like he never touched the keys on the keyboard. So, so that again is not uh, substantiated. Okay. Um, what I would say is that, uh, and I don't have anything to back this up, but what I would say is that given that he seems to be going through their stuff, right? He doesn't just pick it all up and put it in another place, right? Um, I would assume he has some Japanese right now. Mm -hmm. 24 years ago, walking around in Tokyo, you're probably going to have some level of Japanese. So I think if you wanted to, you probably could have negotiated the keyboard uh, mm -hmm. if you wanted to. We also don't know uh, whether or not his keyboard, because it was Apple, we don't know whether it was a keyboard where it had characters and letters on it. So there's nothing to say that, you know, we don't know for sure it wasn't in both uh, both uh, languages, right? So even if he didn't speak Japanese, he could have, he could have used it. But um, ultimately, we, we don't know the answer to that. But it does make you wonder, um, if you were in a, in a house with four dead bodies in a house, uh, in, in a country with a 99.9999% conviction rate, right? So if you're in court, you're going down, right? It's the same conviction rate as like North Korea or Russia. And you're in a, in a house with four dead bodies by your hand, and you're going to just browse a computer? It, it, it suggests either somebody who thinks very strongly they're not going to get caught or that if the alarm was going to be raised it would have been raised already or it suggests a guy who maybe is not thinking straight right maybe is is not able to make good decisions um so so that i think is part of why the, the fact he uses the computer at all is kind of what interests me versus actually what he does on the computer which doesn't seem to be quite you know that much all right all right so we have a question from at charmed 0456 and he or she asks the duplex was originally owned by the sister of the wife right yeah okay so 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 yes and no so essentially it's two houses that are very close together like really close together there's like a very very small gap which from many photos seems like there's no no gap um the the miyazawa home belonged to the miyazawas and um the other home belong to Anne Iriez's family, right? So the, the sister-in-law of Mikio. Um, now to be clear, Anne Iriez is not her real name. This is a, a name that she uses. Um, and it's actually an anagram of Nina and Ray. Mm. Which, wow, which that's interesting. Which I'd never seen before. All right. Um, like I'd never seen a family member do, do that, right? Um, so they buy the house next door to the Miyazawas. And initially they're, they're, they're buying it for Haruko, so the maternal grandmother to to live in and so for many years that was the arrangement right you had the Miyazawas on one side and then Haruko the grandmother on the other side so this is the other grandmother not Setsuko who I met the other one she Correct. passed away a while ago um so that was the arrangement for many years um and then during that time Anne Iria her husband and her boy who I think is sort of maybe around 13 at the time of the murders they were living in the UK uh, because of the dad's job I think it was in Formula One. Um, so they were in the UK for a, quite a while. Uh, when that job ends, um, that's when they come back to Japan. And um, 
they basically move in with Haruko. So now they're all living in that one house. So there's like a bunch of them in these two houses that are very um, sort of close together. Um, we know that the, the noise could have been an issue. Um, there's soundproofing between the two houses, which Mikio paid for uh, himself. Um, now, my sound expert, Rob, when making the when making the podcast, um, you know, took a close look at those walls. Um, and he knows about soundproofing in Japan, and he knows, he's been there a long time, knows about soundproofing in Japan 20 years ago. And he basically said, listen, there is no earthly way, right, that whatever soundproofing Mikio installed between the two houses, there is no earthly way that, that like, you wouldn't have heard a cough between those two walls, let alone people screaming for their lives, okay? So that's a paradox. Now, either they were in shock and there were no screams to hear, and there was only the loud bang, right? That's possible. Or there were screams. Um, we certainly know Mikio fell down some wooden stairs, right? You would have heard that, you would think, if you're going to hear the ladder. So either those things simply went unheard for reasons unknown, right? Or third possibility, they were heard, but for whatever reason, it was said that I didn't hear anything. So I'm not here to make accusations. All I'm saying is it doesn't make sense and from my conversations with the detectives, it didn't make sense to them either. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. I'm not saying that there's any kind of guilt attached to this. I'm just saying it doesn't fit, right? So right. the sound issue is a problem. And we know that those that there was a kind of sound issue um, there because Mikio got the, uh, the the soundproofing. He installed it himself. In terms of Anidia and the two families, look, I, I have to say about her... Like I say, she doesn't use her real name. Um, she has sued people in the media before for for saying stuff about um, about this case. Um, in particular, Asahi TV, who made a documentary with an FBI profiler, and I think it was his sort of view that it was either someone in the family or someone close to the family who who perpetrated these murders. When when Anne found out about this, she she sued them and she won. So we know that, um, and, and you know, good on her. Right, like, right. if you're just trying to sensationalise, then then um, then that's that's deserved. I happen to not think that the killer was in the family. We know the DNA says he's not related to them, or at least closely, right? Um, and also, like I said, I think the police would have found that that connection. We can only go off what she has said in the few interviews she's given. I know that she's spoken before about feeling guilt for allowing that soundproofing to be installed. I know that she kind of maybe feels guilty that they weren't closer. I I'm, I'm paraphrasing what she said here. And, and again, it's through a layer of translation, right? So not to put words in her mouth, but this is kind of more or less um, what she was saying. Um, but look, how many families don't have tension? You know, how many families, you know, do, do you not have cousins or siblings or whoever get on your nerves, especially when you have to, it could be a wife, it could be a girlfriend, it could be your best friend. When you live with someone close up, just this human nature that some people will irritate each other. So I don't want people to listen to this and to think I'm saying, hey, this is, you know, this is where the guilt goes. I'm not saying that. I'm only saying clearly there was some tension there between them, although some tension would be normal and it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, so, yeah, look, the one house belonged to an idiot and then the other house belonged to the Miyazawas. And like I say, he had sold, Mikio Miyazawa had agreed to sell the house uh, before the murders. So any of this crap you see about like, oh, it was someone who murdered them because they wouldn't move out of the house and they were doing it for money, blah, blah, blah. You know, as if there would just be a big pot of gold in his house, which is not how house sales work, number one. And number two, he had sold it. He'd already sold up to the city. So that's not why they died. Um, so I think, does, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thoroughly answers the question. He would also like to know if they had any problems Prior to them moving in, I assume as the Miyazawas. With with Anne's family. Yeah, I guess they wondered if there was any problems prior to moving in. So maybe maybe with the kids or maybe I mean look, we, we, we know we know that because of Ray's developmental uh, issue, we know there's a chance that he might have uh, screamed or shouted out a lot. That could again be a, a factor in why Mikio would pay for that soundproofing uh, on both sides we know that he paid for that right mm -hmm. um you know i think the the stigma attached to disability or um to um 
anyone who is not seen as sort of like quote unquote normative within Japanese society, especially 24 years ago, um, I don't think that would have been easy for anyone uh, connected to that. You know, there's a phrase that you hear a lot in Japan, which is that the nail that sticks up is hammered down. Um, and I think that it would have been really hard. I mean, look, it's hard for anyone, right? Um, let alone in Japan 24 years ago. I'm not sure how much support they would have they would have had. So, yeah, look, there could have been problems, quote unquote. Um, that for sure, there were likely tensions. Um, whether that means anything or not in terms of the murders, I don't know. My gut feeling is no, because I think that the you know the chief, the detectives, I think they would have looked long and hard at that family background, and I think it would be. You know, anyone who, who anyone who's ever actually been in a court of law and and seen a prosecutor at work, if you're just a casual guy, right? If you're just trying to riff, and you just make up a few stories. Like they do this for a living, right? Like if if they were trying to keep a story straight, I think that kind of would have come out, you know, in, in the wash. Um, so far, nothing has come out. So I think that's kind of if there were problems, they've kind of deemed to be part and parcel of just natural family life, right? Okay, so we have at Desert Birdie, and this is more of a statement. It's uh, okay. He says this case is sad. I'm sure the culprit is slash was American military. Mm. So what do you have to say uh, concerning that? It's assuming that the sand came from Edwards Air right. Force Base, right? I mean, I, I guess we can we can talk on the sand specifically uh, later on if, if you like. Um, uh, you know, look. I think it's um, I think it's pretty pretty sort of well known that my theory um, is that that the killer could have well been connected to the U.S. Uh, Air Force. That's a, a for that, that's kind of a theory I've been putting forward for pretty much uh, fifteen years. Um, but look, it's a theory. I, I don't have a smoking gun for it. Um, it just makes the most sense to me given what we know. Um, but look. If you put it another way, um, in those 15 years, um, I have not seen one good reason why uh, it could not be the case. So that's to say, I'm not sure it is this. It just makes the most sense to me. And I haven't seen any good reason so far um, why it could not be so. It's my theory, but, you know, my opinion will change uh, according to the evidence. You know, if somebody, you know, shows me some evidence tomorrow that shoots it out the sky my opinion will change accordingly because otherwise that's that's bats right you got it that's how it works right facts are not debatable um if you look at the idea um that the killer was connected to the u.s air force and when i say that i don't mean like a pilot or a general i mean a familial dependent right so let's go with the age range of the tmpd they say he's as young as 15 right? Maybe as old as 24. So that's kind of old enough to be in the Air Force, right? But to be stationed at Yokota at the age of 24, look, I'm sure it happens. Um, to me, it feels more likely if he was connected to that, uh, to any of the American air bases in Japan, he, he was the son of somebody in the, in the Air Force. And if you put him there, then everything starts to fall into place, mm -hmm. right? Why does he hang out in the house? Uh, into the small hours of the morning well because those bases have curfew right you can't rock up at 3 a.m right but when the gates open at 5 a.m you can right so if you're injured if you're if you're in a foreign country and if you just caught killed four people right the police haven't come yet you can't hear any sirens you've lost a lot of blood maybe you're not thinking straight whatever but you figure i will stay here until the time i know that i can get back on base right and i can hide in a U.S. airbase, which is sovereign U.S. soil, TMPD cannot come there. It's as if you've gone back to America, basically, right? And we also know what it's an airbase, right? They fly in and out every day. You look at the Patriots Express every day, right? Or if not every day, very frequently. No questions asked. It's not the Japanese Aviation Authority stamping anybody's passports at Misawa or Kadena or Yokota or any of these air bases. It is an, an, an internal flight from the US to the US, basically. My feeling is that he is able to vanish because mm -hmm. he goes back to base, gets on a plane, and he never comes back. It's So it doesn't matter how many people you have looking for him in Japan, if he's not in Japan, right? Like, if you lose your keys in the garage, 
but you get your whole family to search in the kitchen. It doesn't matter how many family members you have in the kitchen. You're not going to find the keys, right? So look, that that's my theory and I share that. Um, I've been putting it forward for a long time, but like I say, there aren't any smoking guns. There, there are things that I've said here and that I've said online um, that support it. I would go as far as to say there are also other things that I have not shared that I'm not able to share now, but that when you discover them, you realize, okay, there's not just a slim chance, there is a solid chance, right? So it's my theory, it, it's it's Desert Birdies too. I know it's a bunch of other people's uh, online. And I would just say for anybody who disagrees with it, that's fine. And I respect anybody's um, divergence of view. You know, ultimately we all want the same thing and we're all in this boat because we care about what's happened. But what I would ask is if you don't agree with me, which is fine, um, give me a good reason why I should change my mind. And right. I just, with no arrogance, I've, I've been waiting 15 years to hear one solid reason why it cannot be so. Yes. I mean, I can see why you believe that for the last 15 years. That's a pretty clean escape. <laughs> I mean, look, put it this way, man. Yeah. Like, what does he do in the house? Mistake yeah. after mistake after mistake. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I think you mentioned about the knife, right? It's it's all wrong, right? He, he cuts himself the first time he uses it. Evidence everywhere. He's wearing gloves. He takes them off immediately because he figures I've bled everywhere now. So what? So what difference does it make, right? So everything he does in the house is amateurish and he's taking crazy risks. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about the possible scenarios about what happened to him maybe later on. But I'll just say this: How can it be that in the house he's this amateurish kid who makes all these mistakes and by the grace of God gets away with it? But you know, by the skin of his teeth gets away with it because fortune smiles on him for whatever reason. But the second he leaves the house, he suddenly becomes Jason Bourne and he can just live off the grid. <laughs> right. I mean, it's not easy to live off the grid. We, we know in Japan, we've seen this. If um, anybody who's interested in, in Japanese crime, if you look at the case of um, a killer called Ichihashi, um, so that name is also the name of an investigative journalist, so not to get them confused. One of them is a murderer. He killed an English woman called Lindsay Hawker and the police were beating down his door. He went out the fire escape went on the run for two years. Um, you know, this guy ended up on a desert island by himself, eating lizards, going crazy, two years until he gave up and he said that he couldn't live with it anymore, right? Our guy has gone a quarter of a century, supposedly from the age of 15, no criminal record, committing no crime, stealing nothing, hurting no one ever again, just living off the grid. I mean, you'd have to be like a spy or something, right? So I, I just don't buy it. There are other outcomes, we can talk about that. But for me, I think it just makes a lot more sense if he simply leaves Japan, right, and never has to come back. It's a clean getaway. Right. And if he were to come back, they do do fingerprinting now for anybody who enters the country, right? So, Yeah, since um, since 2008, they introduced that, that system. There are actually exceptions. I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about like um, fingerprinting later on, there are exceptions uh, to this. But yeah, since 2008, if you are not Japanese, you have to give your fingerprint when you come into to Japan. And if he were to do that, um, assuming he's not a Japanese citizen, uh, once his fingerprint pops, that would be it for him. Mm -hmm. And he's murdered four people in, um, I think the law, I think it's called like a cynical murder, which means um, either like murdering children or murdering multiple people. I think it gets classified as what's called a cynical murder, which means an automatic death penalty. Okay. So, so if they get a hold of this guy, they're, they're going to hang him. And, it, and, you know, it'll go through the appeals court for five years, Supreme Court, fine. They will hang that guy if he ever goes back to Japan. Um, so my feeling is he probably knows that and he's unlikely to feel like a holiday anytime soon. Okay. So this one comes from at lovepreetsing93. He says, ask Nicholas if it is possible for the victim's family to know the criminal beforehand. I think we kind of touched on this. Yeah. And what if he was a family member or a neighbor? Actually, we did touch upon on this. So yeah. I don't think you want to revisit that. Um, yeah, basically, he can't be related to them because of DNA. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, from what I understand about um, sort of familial DNA, it gets quite tricky once you go past grandparent kind of level. So beyond grandparents, at that point, the DNA is quite... I, look, I'm not a scientist, but it gets different enough to maybe be a conversation. Are they related or not? But he's not immediate family. He's a completely different blood type uh, to the Miyazawas. It's pretty safe bet to say he's not related to them. Um, physically, 
Um, and in terms of whether he knows them, it is possible, for sure it's possible. Um, I find it very, very unlikely at this stage for, as you say, the reasons we've mentioned. Right. Okay, so we have at Weblight Dreams, and she doesn't really ask a question, but she is really invested in this case, and she gives some theories that maybe you could touch on as well. Uh, mm -hmm. She mentions that South Korea doesn't register everyone. They can't register minors. I assume right. that's true. And so they should resend the blood, I assume, uh, Tokyo police, right? They should mm -hmm. resend the blood to run through the database again, since the killer, if he was underage then, should be registered now. Right. It, did I this think, happen? I think, I think yeah. she means the run the fingerprints, not the blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so for anybody who doesn't know, South Korea, they have a national database of uh, citizens, right? So not criminal, it's just for all citizens. Um, you're, you're on a national database with your fingerprints, which means that um, anybody coming in and out of Korea, um, except certain exceptions such as diplomats and so on, have to give their fingerprints at some point. Um, as the user rightly says, um, if they're underage, then they don't give their fingerprints yet. Now, it's been 24 years. And so far as I know, the TMPD have been in touch with South Korean counterparts across that time. Um, so I don't think they just looked at it once off and left it there, right? That, I mean, that would be dumb if that were if that were the case. It wouldn't make any sense. Um, and as I say, those fingerprints are also on a red notice through Interpol. Um, so look, if he ever came to Korea, um, or if he is Korean and would have aged up since those murders, I think his fingerprints um, would have dinged and they and, and they would have sort of notified um, the TMPD. Now, it, it's it's worth talking about this because, look, th so there's a guy called Dr. M, um, and I don't want to sort of talk too much about Dr. M specifically, but Dr. M is important because the, when we talk about the DNA, when we talk about the, Korea being, uh, the, the killer being Korean, this is coming from Dr. M, uh, his lab. Now, I'm not going to use his real name because he didn't want to be interviewed for Faceless, right? But he's a guy who's high up in, in you know, Japanese DNA circles. Um, if he's right, um, we don't know for sure the killer is Korean, okay? But we know, according to him, there's a fair chance. Now, maybe we'll talk about, like, the, the, the lab and the DNA later on in a, in a subsequent question. But just to say that th this specialist... Um, that, you know, this forensic guy has said he thinks there's a one in four chance the killer was uh, Korean, right? Ethnically, at least. From what we've seen, the killer is not from South Korea, which suggests, therefore, right, he has the ethnicity, but not the nationality or not the passport. So, you know, we spoke about LA, right? To my mind, I've lived there. I've, I've been to Koreatown. You know, Southern California is the largest Korean population outside of Korea. Right now, we have sand from Edwards Air Base in California, seemingly, and we have potentially Korean DNA. Okay, so sooner or later, two and two is four, right? That air base is like an hour driving from Los Angeles, right? So either it's nothing, right, or it's something, but those nothings seem to keep on adding up. And the people who kind of don't share this theory never give me a good reason why those nothings, oh yeah, but that's just coincidence. Sooner or later, man, you know, the, the pile of coincidences is like a Jenga tower in it. And it falls. So yeah, look, um, he he could well be from Korea, but he would by now have aged out into the point where they take his fingerprints. And the TMPD, so far as I know, are in contact with South Korean counterparts. Not just in this case, I think in generally, I think relations are a lot better now. I mean, not that they're perfect between those countries, as anybody knows, but I do think in certain cases they will. Sh you know, it's a whole family that got murdered, man. You know, they're not going to be like, well, World War Two, so screw you, you know, so... Right. Okay. Um, I'm going through her message here. It's, it's a mm -hmm. bit lengthy. I'm trying to cherry pick some things. Okay. Okay. Also, another thing that could have happened, and this is regarding the sand, okay, that mm -hmm. happened regarding the sand is that they might have bought or been gifted the bag from someone from the base or someone who got it from there or it could also have belonged to someone related to someone working at the base. So meaning the kid has never been in, or the person has never been in America. It was a gift, more right, or less. Right. So like mm -hmm. the bag had been to Edwards, but not the killer. Mm -hmm. um, 
there are a bunch of problems with that. Um, I don't want to use the word impossible, but, right. but what I will say is that the, the chief, uh, Chief Suchita, confirmed to me that only the killer's DNA was in the bag. Only his fingerprints, only his hairs, right? Whether it's from his head or, or pubic or otherwise. Uh, only his skin flakes, okay? Only the killers. So if that bag maybe belonged to someone else, then how can there be no traces of them on it? Now, you might, we, we might argue that maybe he cleaned the bag, right? But if he did clean the bag, he did it in such a way where he somehow managed to forensically remove all trace of the previous owner, but somehow leave a bunch of sand grains, right? It, it doesn't make sense. Um, you know, put it this way, when, when, I, when I spoke... When I spoke to them about that bag, they didn't want to get into that topic, but I directly confronted them. I said, look, is there any way this bag could have belonged to someone else? And they weren't like, look, it's impossible it belonged to someone else, but they do not think it belonged to anyone else. They think it's his bag. Mm -hmm. Ergo, if that bag went to California, it went with him, or it went to California with somebody who was like in, in a full hazmat suit using gloves and the rest of it. Two and two is four, right? It's his bag. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's his journey to California, or if we turn it around, what is the evidence for showing it someone else's? You see, this is what I'm saying. A lot of the time, people will say, "No, but what about this?" But but the, what about this? There's zero supporting it. Right? So it, it's convenient to say, but it could belong to someone else. There is no evidence for that. You know, so I don't, I can't discount it. I can only tell you, right? Number one, it doesn't make sense to me, and number two, there's zero supporting a previous owner. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to that. I think yeah, that it does. Sense. Yes. The bag belongs to him. <laughs> it's his bag, man. It's his bag. Also, she continues, another angle is that if they believe it could be someone in the military or related to the military, it might be met with some resistance or told to be pushed aside, meaning a cover-up. I, I think that's where she's headed with this. But what is a red flag is the receipts that were thrown into the bag. She believes that that meant the culprit probably met the family and his Wait, trace. The receipts thrown into the bag? Oh, into the bath. To the bath. Yeah, the bath. Oh, tub. right, the bath. Right, right, right. Right. And she, she feels that there was a connection, a correlation between the killer and the family in those receipts is why he effectively destroyed them that right. way, possibly. I mean, uh, I think you touched upon that. It, it was yeah, I mean, pretty look, innocuous the, the, stuff. Right? Yeah, I mean, look... I mean that that's worth that's worth uh, going back to the mm -hmm. the if if what she's saying is that um, because he put some of the receipts in the bath it it's a red flag or it means something um, respectfully I would say it does not mean that right yeah. there's a chance it could have that meaning it does not mean that um, it it it's a it's a possibility but it's a mere possibility right he but he he dumps a whole bunch of documents in that bath uh, he dumps Yasuko's whole handbag the contents of it in that bath. He takes drawers from the filing cabinet and dumps them into the bath. So the receipts are in there, but so are the tax documents and the tax documents and the ID cards and, and the video rental card and so on and so forth. So look, right, it, it's like if I if I say, well, they had a parrot in the house, so that means the killer loved birds. Maybe, but it's, but it's one element in amongst these millions of elements. Um, so... Lots of people, like I say, kind of point towards the documents as I think it's quite a sort of tantalizing, appealing idea, right? Because it, it suggests a narrative, it suggests a bigger story, which is what we do as humans. We try and make sense of it, right? Here's the problem, though. Um, using that kind of hard and fast language is saying two and two is five, full stop, all right? It, it, it's it's not. Um, it's it's There's a chance, sure. There is zero to support it. I would say that um, we could argue just as easily that after he was done in the house, he decided two minutes before he was leaving, hey, you know what? I'm going to make it seem like a robbery gone wrong. So I'm just going to dump a bunch of stuff in the bath, move some stuff around, um, steal a bit of money. And hey, look, it's a robbery, right? Maybe the documents mean something. Maybe they don't, right? So I'm just here to say that, like, I, you know, to, to mm -hmm. spoil the fun and say we, we just simply don't know that. Right. Could be a red flag. It also could be zero. Yeah. I, I think she just believes that it was a personal grudge or maybe this is just her one theory she's throwing out there, you know, mm -hmm. to get the to get the discussion started. Um, 
Oh, and she touched upon the serial killer aspect. I guess from my video, she says, and yes, killers start with killing animals. That should have been a clear sign to the police that those animal crimes were happening. But sadly, back then, people rarely made the connection. So so, so, so that mm -hmm. guy who'd killed those cats, well, yeah, he was actually torturing them. I think some of the cats died, um, sorry to say, to, yeah. to the viewers. But I think it was primarily he was torturing them. Um, they found that guy. Okay. The chief, the chief arrested that guy. He worked at a bank locally. Now, interestingly, he maintains his innocence, which as anybody who knows about um, Japanese crime will know, it's kind of rare. Normally, you know, confession is a lot more common in, in Japan. Um, this guy says he didn't do it. So that's worth mentioning. Um, but they do know that the guy uh, had nothing to do with these murders. Okay. So so it, it, it seems to be uh, on first you know, glance that maybe there's a connection with these cats being tortured and then in the same park, the family, the family uh, turning up dead. At least as far as the guy who was doing it um, is concerned, he had nothing to do with those murders. So look, I'm, I'm not here to say that there isn't a link between torturing animals and then working your way up to murders, but at least as far as this case is concerned, that's not what happened in Soshigaya Park. Right. Okay. Now, we're going to get to some of my questions that oh, I have right. for you. Okay, so... For the, for the money, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So this one I wanted to talk about regarding uh, one of your posts on Reddit. And okay. uh, let me just read it to you so I can refresh your memory. Mm -hmm. So you wrote, as for what it contained, the fanny pack, TT, which is Takeshi, uh, Tushita, the detective at the time. Yeah, right was quite guarded on this weirdly one of the only subjects he wouldn't freely talk on after hours and hours of interviews so it was something in the bag that i assume you were alluding that he wasn't talking about yeah he he was he was guarded um mm -hmm. he was guarded on that topic and like i say in that post it's weird because he was open about um surprisingly right because i expected him to be guarded on quite a lot um, he wants this case solved and, and he was open. Um, the whole point about the sand is bizarre. Like, it's a clear indication, right, where the killer was before the murders, right? It, it's, it, it, they, they are his footsteps before the murders that lead into the house. Um, which is another way of saying it, it's a step towards identifying who this man is. If we turn it around, what good reason is there for ignoring that sound? I can't think of one good reason, okay? So we could argue that the TMPD aren't interested in the sand because maybe it's a false lead and, that, and they've dismissed it. Um, fine, I, I'm telling you, where, where something was a waste of time, the chief told me, right? The chief would have said, we investigated that, we discounted it. He could have just said that, he did not, right? Um, I, I, I will, I'll put it like this. There seemed to be an acknowledgement that that sand could lead somewhere, right? Um, but at the same time, it felt like they were not keen to do that. So, so that's a disconnect. If it leads somewhere, you follow it, right? Mm -hmm. um, my my guess is, without sounding sort of like a conspiracy theorist, there are political realities between those two countries. There are there is a diplomatic situation between those two countries, um, and I think it explains why there is that kind of reticent to follow those sand grains if they lead back to the US military installation in America because that's going to be a can of worms, right? So put it this way, if the killer is a US military brat, that's bad for everyone in, involved, right? There, there are no good answers, right, for the Japanese or for the Americans. Um, so look, it's possible that they know something I don't, right? That's, of course, it's entirely possible, but also it's equally true they could have told me right then and there, listen, drop the sand, it's a waste of time, right? They did not do that. So right. um, I, I think the sand point is bizarre. Um, do, do you want to talk about the, the sand itself and the process of being able to kind of identify? Because, you know, like I say, the, the expert I spoke to, Lorna Dawson in the podcast, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything uh, you know, about this. I didn't know you could go so deep with a grain of sand. That she she's a kind of a lead, world leading expert, but in the UK within these circles, everybody knows her. There was a case in Scotland of a guy who was uh, suspected 
of murdering his wife, but uh, they couldn't they couldn't pin it on him, and he was going to go free. Um, and so the, the the police approached Dr. Dawson and they said, "Listen, is there any way you can help us?" And so she said, "Let me look at his car." She looked at the wheels, and she found some sand in the treads of the tires, and she analysed that sand and she said, "Go to Island 52, tiny little island, and go to to Sand Dune B." And there was the body of the wife, right? Wow. So, so, so that sand, like I'm saying, right, could tell the TMPD, right, where this guy was. So my question is, why do they not want to know? So I leave it to your viewers to, to make your own conclusion, you know. Either it's a waste of time, and if so, they could have told me it was a waste of time. Or it's not a waste of time, but they can't talk about it. And that's the secondary subject. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've thought a lot about this smoking sand right like right, right. what what do you think um could possibly be the reason why they're so coy about this topic okay look the, the, the thing about the tmpd um they are the best funded police force on earth um they're the largest or or they're up there with the nypd um they they have state-of-the-art technology um they have a police science campus in in chiba um there aren't any rules about investigating sand in Japan. So if they wanted to, mm -hmm. they could they could do it right now. Um, it, it's not beyond the wit of man to look into this sand, right? Um, somebody, I think, has traced the sand already because this is where the word Edwards comes from. And I directly said to the chief, I said, look, is this Edwards thing just a hoax? Is this just some like journalist who's BSing and just floats out a name and just hope he wouldn't say that you know I'm sure it came from somewhere so so that would mean the call is coming from within inside the house right mm -hmm. now I don't know if it was them specifically maybe it was the university they approached because the reason why we know about the Korean thing the reason why we know about the one in four chance he's Korean one in ten chance he's Chinese one in ten chance he's uh he's um Japanese is from this leak from dr m's lab it's possible the same um is true for the for the sand okay um my question would be throughout all those hours of interviews um why wouldn't they simply tell me no the sand doesn't mean anything right well no we looked into it, it doesn't go anywhere uh, it's a red herring they wouldn't even need to explain to me why it was they could just say no drop it um so look why um it it's just a guess but I think there is a political and diplomatic reality between these two nations, right? Japan relies on the US, um, vice versa. If the killer turns out to be an American, it would be a big headache. If he turns out to be an American military brat, it's going to be a major ache in another body part. It's, it's a problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is already a huge controversy uh, in Japan about the presence of American military bases, right? That they are a sovereign nation. Um, it's 80 years since World War II. Um, I understand the Japanese, um, why they don't want American military bases in their nation, uh, particularly when we've seen cases of uh, American military personnel going out and committing crimes against uh, Japanese citizens. Like if you Google it, case after case after case, most famous of which is probably the, the Okinawa rape case. Um, it's important though for me to say like it's not just my opinion right like i've i've spoken to many military personnel who were or are stationed in japan and they've all pretty much said the same thing the relationship between these two nations is tricky but it's crucial right um so my guess is that if i am able to put a trail together right from edwards to soshigaya park if i'm able to do that right and the TMPD were able to do that very quickly. I spoke to um, a kind of senior figure in the world of uh, Japanese crime writing. He's, a, he's also the editor of a major newspaper in, in the UK. Um, I spoke to him for about four hours and he said to me, listen, Nick, if, if this has occurred to you, I'm telling you this occurred to them on day one. They are sharp people, okay? But one thing is it occurs to them and another thing entirely is for them to be able to do anything about it. Those are two different things. Right. So anybody who's watching this who doesn't buy my logic, like 
that's fine. But my question to them would be, um, why would the TMPD go all the way to Korea on the possibility of a large shoe size? Like, why would they fingerprint one million men? Why would they still have 40 guys full time on this today? 24 years later, you would never see this in the UK. You would never see, you know, even the NYPD, you're not gonna have 40 detectives on a 24 year old cold case. Like they wouldn't put all of these enormous resources on this case, right? But then just look at the sand and go, ma, whatever. There has to be a reason for that. And my question is, why wouldn't they tell me directly what that reason is? Well, it's either because they don't want to or they're not able. So look, when we're talking about America, crickets, they don't want to talk about it. But for everything else, they'll move heaven and earth. So my question is, you know, if, if it's not the political reality between these two countries, then what is it? And like I say, 15 years in this case, I'm yet to hear alternatives, man. This is, I'm not here because I like this theory. I'm not here because it's my pet theory and it's my favorite opinion. I'm here because it makes the most sense. And I haven't been able to break the theory yet. You know what I mean? I'm open to it. If someone comes along <laughs> with a better theory, hit me. But until now, it stands. Right. And there's also California City, right? They, they, yeah. From, from what you gathered in the podcast, they really didn't know much about this case at all. That uh, right. had something to do with pretty much in their backyard, one of the most brutal killings in Japan. And right. um, from that, does that just tell you that uh, the TMPD didn't call around to? I, mean, look, I, I, I think, I think there's probably two parts to that. Mm -hmm. um, one, I know, and this is not a criticism of Japan at all, right? Um, but I know that going outside of the the kind of the norm culturally is not easy within old Japanese institutions such as the TMPD, right? Um, so to make those phone calls, number one, wouldn't have necessarily been, you know, just sure, make a few calls to California State, right? Like I'm, I'm not sure it would have been that easy, um, like in, in, in the in premise. But at the same time, they do have English speakers, they do have translators, you know, it's not it's not beyond the wit of man to be like, hmm, so this sound that comes from over there, maybe should we make a call to the local police station to see if they have anything else? Right. And like I say, when I spoke to the California City uh, Sheriff's Office, you know, they said, number one, we've never heard of this. Number two, we would give them anything and everything we have to help. Mm -hmm. Number three, it could just be a phone call, right? Now, there's a series of unsolved murders within California City, including a home break-in and a home invasion murder. They told me in California City Police Station that they kind of knew who did that, but the others are unsolved. So I'm not saying the killer did all of these murders, but what I'm saying is how did the TMPD know that, right? It could be. And if you did, those guys could be sitting on a gold mine, right? They could, you know, they might have the same fingerprints, so on and so forth. I don't know. But I'm just saying, like you say, you know, if you're going to put 280,000 guys on this case, across 24 years, you're going to move heaven and earth, you know, millions upon millions of yen, man hours, looking for this one man. What's one good reason you don't make a phone call? And this is not a criticism of them. What, what I'm saying is, the answer I think is, if there's a diplomatic reality, that if you make that call, it leads to more problems, then maybe that can of worms is the reason why. I don't know. It's just what makes sense to me. Right. Okay, so this is one of my favorite things about the the case is the entry of the killer. Now, okay. you've been there, so you've seen firsthand what it looks like between the fence, the tree, the house, and the back-to-the-back uh -huh. back bathroom. Is there any way that someone can maneuver perfectly to get into that window? So... um. They actually did, uh, there's a Japanese TV station, I can't remember the name, but you can find it online. Okay. They actually did a recreation. Um, so they got a kind of, in the studio, they built this house, they built the fen fence to the exact dimensions. There's like a sort of fake tree and stuff. And they got a guy uh, at the TV channel to, to to climb it. And he manages to do it. He does do it. Okay. So is, is it physically possible? Yes. However, as you know, the guy, the, the killer, leaves no traces of himself on the window or inside the window sill. Right. right. Number one. Number two, in the reconstruction, 
the guy doing it in the TV station, he gets up to the window. He goes through the window head first because that's the only real way you can do it. I don't see how it's possible that the killer can do that without A, making noise because that fence moves as it does in the reconstruction. The walls are thin. His body hits it to get up there, right? Mikio is working on his computer, not that far away. He hears zero, right? B, he leaves no trace of himself in the window, although he does cut out the fly screen. We know that because the fly screen is found on the floor below and his footsteps are in the mud out there. That mud is not in the window or in the windowsill, okay? So as far as it looks like, he goes up to the window but doesn't go through. Right. It's physically possible, but in that recreation, it didn't look easy. And I think that's kind of what the killer concludes as well. The alternative, of course, um, the main alternative that's discussed, of course, is the front door. I, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's the closest thing I would say in this case to being impossible. Um, you're not going to open the door to a guy unless, you know, I mean, home visits in Japan are less common anyway, right? Like the time I've spent there, very rarely is someone going to be like, come to mine for dinner, right? It's not like a common thing. Again, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but just there's less of a culture of that. And this was late, you know, this is like 11 o'clock. He had his kids upstairs. Nina was feeling sick. It's, you know, right before New Year's Eve. If he opens that door and lets that guy in, looking the way he looks, by the way, with the face mask and the hat and the rest, it's because he knows that guy and he knows him well enough to recognize him despite the get up. So my question is, if he knows him that well, right, then how do the police, you know, you would have to be close to someone to trust them that much to let them in. Because we know that he doesn't attack Mikio right away. He doesn't just push past him, right? Because he has to get past Mikio and have enough time to strangle Ray to death. That doesn't happen in the movie, like in the movies in 10 seconds. He starts stabbing Mikio in the face and the head from above. I think the third possibility and the most likely, um, or at least the thing that fits the best, is Ray's balcony. Um, if you look at it, there's a reason why the first images you see of the case the next day, the TMPD are dusting the car, but the side mirrors and, and the roof. I think they think he gets up on top of the car and then up into Ray's balcony. Um, it's not a challenging climb to do that. Um, it has the least amount of problems with it, number one. We also know that the, the Miyazawas did their laundry out on that um, balcony, like it, like is very common in Japan. So those sliding locks, because you can actually see the mechanism online, those sliding no locks are not particularly complicated to force. But also, we don't even know if, they, if it was locked. It's possible. You know, you're opening it and shutting it 10 times a day. People in Japan said to me, I leave mine unlocked all the time. I just forget, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can see them in, in the images. If he does go through Ray's balcony, then everything flows. He, he strangles Ray first because he's the first person he comes to. And the reason he strangles him is not because of any kind of like emotional connection. It's not because of, you know, people have spoken about autism and this stuff where I don't even know where it comes from, right? Like he does it because that's the first person he comes to and he's trying to retain the element of surprise. He's trying to be quiet, right? So from that bedroom, uh, so from that uh, raised balcony, because he moves in and out of that room a lot, and we know that by the bloody footprints, I think it holds that it is his entry point because that's why he keeps on going back into Ray's room because he keeps on looking out the window, which you would, right? Like if you killed a bunch of people, is anybody coming? Are the police coming? And so on and so forth. So I think that's how he manages it because it's the one that has the least amount of problems uh, with it. What's weird about the balcony is that the TMPD never mention it. And I don't see that there's any good reason for it. Clearly, they've considered it. They dusted the car. Um, so look, I could be wrong. Maybe he did go through the window. Maybe he did go through the door. But it, it, it kind of breaks the order and the logic, whereas the balcony does not. Okay. So there's just something interesting. Like, I never knew that he cut out. I thought he just yanked off the entire frame of the netting, right, for the back I, bathroom. I, I think he maybe. Well, maybe you're right. I th but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think he maybe like made some incisions and then pulled. I'm not quite sure, mm -hmm. but certainly his gloves are on at that point. Um, and like I say, if he did go through the window, because remember, right, like he's walking around in the mud uh, yes. below. So I think if he goes through that, and, and also I'm pretty sure there was some water in the bath. 
So in Japan, once you've had your bath, you leave the water for the next person to use, like especially really? in the family, right? This is oh. the, the custom. So I think there was water in there already, probably for Mikio to use later on, right? Maybe he tops it up or whatever. But um, so that would have made a splash as well on some level. But how does he manage to get through the window? Okay, no fingerprints because he's wearing gloves, but 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 no mud. Mm -hmm. The feet don't touch. You, you know what I mean? It, that, it's possible that stuff is there and they just haven't mentioned it. But but like I say, um, I, I do think there's a reason why the TMPD were looking at the, the roof of the car because it was parked right underneath Ray's balcony, not right. in the garage. And actually the garage is the one place that the, um, I said garage, they're like an American person. The, the, the garage is the one place that the, the killer never enters. It's the one room he never touches. I see. So it's possible that he actually went up that way in the back, saw that mm -hmm. it's not practical, came back down, right. came to the front. And right. I, that's why I stole it from you, the balcony right. idea for my working theory. And uh, I think I think we're onto something there. <laughs> I, I think I, they're I just think not. So, man. Yeah. Okay, that's the entry of the killer. Oh, I would also like to ask, okay, in, in my own little theory, I put at the end of the video, isn't it possible that he came in that two hour window when Mikio and Ray were at the shops and Yasuko was away picking up pictures? There's a um, two hour window between five and seven. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it, it is possible. Um, mm -hmm. But but just like off the top of my head, I would say there are a couple of um so there are a couple, a couple of sticking points to that he would need a good hiding place in that house um okay and as you see it's not big um and he would be taking an even bigger risk than the one he took already right because he would be entering that house um you know by 5 p.m maybe it's kind of darkish but but certainly people could have seen him people are going to be moving around in the park at 5 p.m playing tennis going for a run whatever um so so it's a much bigger risk we know that he he takes risks. We've seen that, so I'm not saying it's it's impossible. Um, what I would say is, if he does do that, if he is in the house and he is waiting for them, that would completely remove um, the possibility of opportunism. If he's waiting in the house for them, then that would definitely, to me at least, confirm that he was there to destroy them. Mm -hmm. um, you know. So, so look, um, th there's nothing I can point to to say there's no way that happened. Um, but I think that certainly he would have had to have entered the house in such a way where it didn't make any noise for the people next door to hear it. Because, I, it, you know, I think that Haruko at least is home all day. He also would have had to do it in such a way where when the family gets home, they don't see anything as amiss. And he also would have then had to wait from, let's say, 7 p.m. till like... 11 p.m right to then start killing people so so my question would be like if he did do that like what would be the benefit in you know those five hours six hours whatever it is just waiting around um why not just like the minute they come through the door kill them and leave and then it would be like well because too many people would see but then it then it gets into the same problem of but but anybody could have seen at any time anybody could have heard at any time right like how does he not know from from the first screen the family next door picks up the phone. How does he not know that? Right. There's no way he can know that. So it's like a wild risk. So, so look, yeah, look, that that's possible. Um, and actually, funnily enough, I've I've never heard someone uh, make that suggestion, which is kind of rare because I've heard it all with this case. Hey. Um, <laughs> so yeah, man. But but yeah, I've got nothing to shoot that down concretely. That's a very patient man. That's <laughs> all I got. I was just yeah, just shooting at the hip there. But um, okay, so I would also like to ask, is it also, is it even possible to get in the back window, which we've covered? Has a detective attempted? Yeah, we've covered that. And we we know what your favorite theory is on how he got in via mm -hmm. the balcony. Now, is it true that Ray's room had the most footprints? Where? Yes. So it was. So that that would lead to your balcony theory even even more plausible yeah yeah man and and you know i think um i mean like i say it's quite easy to picture him going back and forth to the balcony which the balcony you could see the street kind of gives you the best view the same as in the front room but but the, but the window's a bit bigger and there's like you know it, it, 
you know, I think he's going there to 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 see, you know, has anybody heard? You know, because remember, what does this guy do? He leaves, he never comes back. He doesn't give himself up. He patches up his injury. So for people who suggested that he's cuckoo, right, and the rest of it, well, no drugs or medication was found in his in his system, number one. And number two, um, he's not on any lists anywhere, mm-hmm. right? So if he is crazy and the rest of it, well, he's shown self-preservation. So I think it follows that he would be looking out of that window to check, am I still good? Um, so yes, he's walking around in Ray's room a lot. I think he's tracking back and forth between doing what he's doing and then just checking. Um, maybe he's sizing up the right moment to, to leave, to escape. But it, but it also makes sense um, because we know that once Ray is murdered, he never touches Ray again. Um, and actually that goes for all the bodies. Once they're dead, he leaves them alone. Um, and, th- and this includes sexually as well, because some people have suggested this is a possibility. I think I say in my podcast, there is no sexual component here. Um, he doesn't touch himself at the scene. There's no fluids are found. He doesn't disturb the bodies. He doesn't touch their underwear. That's not why he's there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to remember as well, we know he doesn't touch uh, Ray because he cuts himself the minute he uses the knife. The second he uses the knife, he's cut himself. So he's bleeding freely. But there is no blood on Ray, or I'm pretty sure on his bed either. So once Ray's out of the way, he's not bothered about Ray again, but he's going into the room a lot. Um, so yeah, like you say, that kind of supports the balcony theory. Um, and yes, he goes into the he goes into the bathroom, uh, both to dump the stuff into the bathtub, um, the toilet was actually a separate room. It's like a small water closet kind of room. Um, but also he goes into the bathroom to to get medical supplies for himself once the once the family is dead. So yeah, it's interesting to me that he he's tracking into the into Ray's room kind of more than all the other rooms, just based on his footprints alone. Were there bloody footprints in yeah, in the room? Um, yes. Um we know that uh because the bodies, except for Mikios, which is at the foot of the the the, the bottom of the stairs. And obviously Ray, who didn't bleed, who was in blood in bed. Um, we know that down the stairs, at the bottom, a lot of blood all over the stairs, and especially at the bottom of the stairs where Mikio's body ends up. And also in that kind of landing area um, between, you know, the kitchen, the front room, and the rooms and the bathroom, where the where the where the where the mother and the daughter are found, there's a lot of blood there. So there's no real way um, around that blood, right? He doesn't want to slip. You remember, these floors are wooden. Okay, so they're going to be slippery. So he's not going to be, you know, and he doesn't want to take his shoes off, right? So he's tracking blood left, right, and center. Um, and he, we know that he leaves pretty much all the clothes he can leave after the murders, but not the shoes, right? Because Mikio's feet are too small for him. So he has to keep his own shoes. And I guess he figures, well, who's going to look at my shoes? So not that he had any choice about it, but he keeps the shoes on. Anything else he can dump, right, behind, he does. And then he ends up taking Mikio's sweatshirt um, and leaves his jacket, just the sweatshirt. That's the only thing that we know he steals, as well as around, I think it's a few hundred um, equivalent dollars. But like I say, he leaves about 500. So he he leaves more than he takes. Um, and Mikio's sweatshirt, they're the only things he takes. I think he takes that out of necessity because his, his stuff is covered in blood. He can't take it with him. He leaves it. He grabs the dad's stuff. And then he's going to be walking around at whatever time of the morning, um, three, four, five a.m., uh, wearing only a sweatshirt with his hand bandaged, including with um, you know Yasuko's menstrual pads because he runs out of medical supplies. So he's walking around, and if someone sees him, they're going to remember that. No jacket. Also, bearing in mind, um, Tokyo is full of koban. So for anybody who doesn't know what koban is, it's it's basically like a mini police station where like a low level cop. Uh, is basically there to just help out citizens. So normally it'll be like, oh, I'm lost, or you're dealing with a drunk guy, or like, you know, there's a cat up a tree or whatever. But but they are a pair of eyes, and they're everywhere. And there's one very close to Soshigaya Park. Now, the killer seemingly does not go that way, okay? So either he got lucky again, as he seems to do a million times, right? Or, you know, maybe he knew the guy was there and thought, well, I won't go that way, I'll go this way. But yeah, he would have looked... I don't want to say suspicious, but I think he would have been notable. Um, we know that, as Ryushi says, uh, the Japanese, they, they will grasp, they will snitch. If they <laughs> see something, they will say something. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody saw anything. All those witness accounts, 
I'm here to tell you, they didn't hold water, not one of them, um, so far as the TMPD is concerned. Nobody saw this guy. So, you know, my question to you, Muggs, how does he How does he vanish? How does he do that? He doesn't get on a train, right? It's Tokyo at the time has 31 million people, right? So it's almost the population of California in one town, right? So even if you get on the first train of the day, not one guy sees you, not one camera. How does he do it? Jason Bourne. <laughs> well, there is that theory that he has a car. Right. I think that's the one. I yeah. think it solves the most. Well, my logic generally here, it's it's what has the fewest problems with it, what solves the, what kind of checks the most boxes. And to me, the car, um, the car does that, right? It's, it's, you know, look, he either walked out of that place, which means he lived locally because he must have been home quick enough for nobody to notice him. And I think if he's local, I think they catch him, right? Uh, option number two, he manages to jump on a night bus and just by the grace of God, nobody's looking at him that day, right? Possible, but no cameras either. I don't buy it. Or, or number three, the guy has a car, which explains everything, which explains how he drifts to that house unseen. Because remember, we know what he looks like before he goes into the house. Nobody yeah. sees that guy and nobody sees him leaving afterwards. One of the few sightings that I actually do believe I actually do believe is relevant. We know that Yasuko talks about a car parking too close to the house. Right. Um, if you look at maps from the day, um, sort of aerial images taken from the from the news helicopter the day after the, the, the bodies are found, you can see the space she's talking about. Kind of a small field, kind of diagonally across from her house. Now, for her to have noticed that um, and then mentioned it, makes me think there is a chance that she was looking at the man who would kill her. Um, and I can tell you that it sounds to me as if the TMPD have not discounted that. Mm -hmm. So they're not stupid, as I say. They will know that there was a chance that the guy arrives and leaves in a car, but they haven't said anything about a car. It, they didn't discount anything about a car. So, so yeah, man, I think, I think, as you say, I think that's the, I think maybe that's the one. Yeah. And this wouldn't be something that they would hold close to the vest in terms of evidence. Um, you think, right? They'd want the public to know maybe this man left by car or whatnot. Right. Like, I mean, put, put it this way. If mm -hmm. you look at, um, so they, they have um, like an information appeal uh, document, um, which you can find online. And there's been versions of it down the years. Uh, some of them are in English too. And they're a kind of compilation of all the relevant information about the killer and that night and so on. They go as far to talk about what was on TV that day. And they describe the programs that were on TV, they give them names and actors and so on and so forth. Um, they're asking about, you know, do you do you know anybody who used to wear Dracar Noir aftershave? Mm -hmm. Did you see any arguments in the area? Blah, blah, blah. So they're, they're covering uh, their bases. They don't say anything about a car. Maybe, maybe Yasuko was wrong. Maybe, you know, maybe she was just looking at a guy who parked there and thought, well, I'm not meant to park here, but I will because I can't be bothered. You know, maybe it's got nothing to do with it. What I, what I would say, though, is um, if 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 they are looking at CCTV of that night, it's not difficult to say, OK, load up the cameras from 1.23 a.m. in Soshigaya. Let's find every single guy in a car driving around at 1.23 a.m. up until, you know, daybreak. Now... It's possible that they have this guy on camera, but they can't link the car anyway, right? Maybe they don't get a number plate. You know, maybe they can't quite make out the model. 24 years ago, CCTV isn't great. Um, but what I can tell you is that within the last, I think it's 18 months, th th this thing you see about the guy on the CCTV buying the knife in the supermarket, yeah. that feels promising, right? Because we know that's the only thing he buys. The day before, they're murdered with that same knife. They found him recently. They tracked the guy down, matched him to the CCTV. He's innocent. It's not the guy. It's just a guy buying a sushi knife, right? But what does it tell you? It tells you they're still bloody looking, mm -hmm. right? So that CCTV, if it's there, they're analyzing it. And I and I would imagine that is going to include cars as well, right? So, hey man, I don't know. Maybe I'm completely wrong about this, but I do think if you if you if you find a, sus a suspicious car, right, you identify that car. Now you have the killer. 
or you have his dad or you have his friend or whatever but you find the guy through that so look it might tie into the to the u.s military thing i'm talking about and maybe that's why they don't want to talk about it or maybe they've you know they've got reason to believe it's got nothing to do with it but i think it's a chance and i think it's it's out there yeah Well, this one's an interesting one. So on Reddit, I was reading, oh, yeah. you mentioned that the killer used Yasuko's sanitary pads, which are, I assume, menstrual pads, right? Yes, yes. So um, to patch up his wounds. Now, where did he find those and what kind of person would know to do this? Not a kid, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, Yeah, not a kid. Um, mm -hmm. Look, man, that's, that's um, I think that's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. I, he, he finds them, I believe, in the bathroom. Um, and I think he comes to them once he's run out of um, medical supplies. The medical supplies are out because, like I say, you know, it's, really, it's just kind of heartbreaking. You know, the girl, Nina, when she realizes her mom's hurt badly at the foot of the stairs, kind of, it seems as if that's where she kind of collapses. She runs to the bathroom to get the first aid kit and she's bringing it back. The killer uses that first aid kit, right? Mm -hmm. um, but clearly it's not enough. Now, I believe that he cuts his hand in two places. He slices his little finger and I think he cuts his wrist, right? So the best I can make it is he's cutting himself here and then he's cutting himself here, right? So as you're stabbing, if you're stabbing something hard like a skull, right? As I'm doing that, I'm cutting myself here because I'm grabbing it. But also when I meet resistance, that knife, right? As it bends back like that, it's gonna slice there. So it follows. So he's bled at least a fair amount. When he runs out of medical supplies, it seems as if he moves on to Jessica's um, menstrual pads. Who who would know how to do that? Look, when I was 15, you know, with my girlfriend at the time, uh, I know how it works. You know, you, you, see, you see these things around. Would it have crossed my mind? No. Mm -hmm. Right? But it crossed this guy's mind. Now, how long is a piece of string, right? Like... What kind of person, like you say, on first glance, not a kid, but maybe the kid, maybe it's a kid who's got a bunch of sisters, you know, who's raised by them. Um, maybe maybe he's, you know, with a girl who was open about these things. I don't know. But I would say another type of person who would know how to do this um, is someone, if they didn't have military training, they are adjacent to military training. Um, I spoke to military personnel about this and they, and they replied, um, yeah, the Iraq war. We, you know, these things, um, they they are both um, disinfected, right? So it's, it's good for the wound, but also they're going to sponge that blood up. So it's going to help you. So they're plugging bullet wounds with their comrades and stuff like that in these combat situations. Your average Joe, you know, you shoot an average Joe in his leg. Does he know to put one of those in his wound? Probably not. Nope. But if you've been trained to do it, or if you know people who have, and you see them there, you go, great, that'll do, you know? So much better to use her pads than, you know, like a dish rag or something, which maybe you're going to get infected. This is the last thing you want. So I don't know. But like you say, I think it's kind of um, illuminating as to the kind of man he or boy he was, right? Like he does a lot of dumb things, but reading in, and this is just, you know, me reading in, I think he's probably an intelligent kid um, I think he's, you know, maybe a smart kid who was able to pivot when things went wrong, right? If I'm in a body, if I'm in a house with four bodies, and, I, and I'm gonna get, and I'm gonna hang for this, I'm gonna freak out. I'm gonna panic. This guy, maybe he was panicking too, but he had enough presence of mind to make active decisions like this. You know, he doesn't run straight out into the street bleeding, right? He takes his time. We know he's in that house for at least a couple of hours. So I don't know why he's able to do that. Like I say, he could have been hurt or he could have been not thinking straight. He's lost a lot of blood. But to be able to look at those pads and think, that's what I need. Like you say, I don't think it's your average Joe. I think it's indicative of something. Yeah. As we talk, I'm more and more coming to your side on a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my job then. Yeah. All right. Let me see if this still is a good question since we've touched upon a lot of stuff the sand found in the fanny pack from what i uh -huh. gathered the tokyo police won't say where it's from right. or do they not know 
I think I think they know. <laughs> I think point. we've kind of covered it. Yeah. Let, yeah. Put it, let, let me just say one more thing about that. I think I think that they if they don't know, mm-hmm. it's not because they couldn't find out. Let me just say that. Right. Okay, we don't have to go over that one then. Yeah. Um Okay, so from Redditor Smoikoid, he states okay. uh matter of factly he says, see, the fingerprint info is a really strong indicator that all that the perpetrator is Japanese. All foreigners have been fingerprinted upon entry into Japan for the past decade or so. But Japanese citizens are not fingerprinted. That means either the person is deceased, hasn't entered Japan or is a Japanese citizen. Do you agree with this? Um. So, so I have a lot to say about that. Um, <laughs> yes. I um, look. I, I understand why um, this uh, smorkoid. Why, why smorkoid is a great <laughs> name. Yeah, I understand why they would uh, come to that conclusion. Um, I, respectfully, I would say that I disagree for for a bunch of reasons. Um, reason number one, like we mentioned, that the fingerprinting system comes into effect around two thousand and eight. So that's a decade almost um, after the murders. Uh, so that means the guy could have been flying in and out of Japan on business, like on a weekly basis, which is like 400 times plus in and out of Japan without having to worry about that. So that's that's number one. Um, it, it just simply didn't exist back in the year 2000. Um, number two, it is true that Japanese citizens are not fingerprinted. They're not subject to, the, to that telemetry and all of that. Um, but that doesn't take into account other subsets of people. Um so, for one, I mentioned diplomats, right? They're not subject to fingerprinting. Um, they could be from Swiss. They could be Swiss. They could be Saudi, right? They could be from Somalia. Um, they're not giving up their fingerprints. I'm not sure if that also includes their direct family members. I'm not sure about that. But certainly the diplomats don't have to do that. Um, another group we should talk about um, are dual nationals, right? Um if you have dual nationality in Japan, so so Japan's actually kind of weird about this. It's um, a list of quite a short list of countries that that basically make it illegal to be a dual national. Right? I think it's at the age of twenty one. You basically have to say, like, let's say you, your mum is Japanese, but your dad is like English, right? Uh, at the age of twenty one, you basically have to say to Japan, "I'm either opting in or I'm opting out." Okay. Um, like I'm a dual national. At no point do I have to say to Britain or to Spain, hey, I pick either one of you. I have both of those for life, right? Um, Not so in Japan. I think it's like Iran, Russia, Japan, who doesn't, you know, all the chill countries who don't allow this uh, to be a thing. Now, I'm saying that um, because it's it's important for me to mention that it's not easy to do. But however, I do know people who... um, who, who are half Japanese, who do, you know, live in uh, Europe, um, but then go back in and out of Japan when they have work or when they want to see their family or whatever and have both passports. Um, so there are ways to finagle the system, right? So the killer could have been Japanese, um, but he could have also been Japanese and something else at the same time. So small coids point doesn't stand up to the dual national point or the diplomacy point. Um, it kind of, but then there's the third one, which we kind of mentioned, uh, which is the US military, right? So so you can actually go online and you can see videos of uh, US Air Force personnel and their families entering US uh, military bases in Japan with zero checks from the country of Japan. Zero checks, right? Obviously, their passports and the rest of it are checked. But who are they checked by? The US military, not Japan. This is not shared data with Japan. Right. Japan, put another way, does not know if Billy Bob from Arkansas is in their country or not. So once, of course, because when he's on the base, he's still within the US, but he's perfectly free to, you know, in his downtime, leave the base and go to Shibuya and have a bubble tea and go back. Right. So so basically, Japan doesn't know who's coming in and out. Put another way. Um, So, yeah, I I would kind of disagree with Smallcoy's point um, in that I think there are several ways in which... Um, it doesn't necessarily follow that the fingerprinting means he has to be Japanese. But I do think his point leads into um, the kind of theories about where he is now. Okay, so let's say 
we go back to the Jason Bourne thing. Let's say he is Japanese, um, which is, of course, possible, right? Like I said, that killer, Ichihashi, he did it. He was on the run for two years. And he ends up eating lizards and stealing bread and doing what he can to survive on the run, right? He managed two years. And that blew people's minds back then. It's not to say it's impossible that people can't live double lives and the rest of it. But, like, he's 15, and in the house he's sloppy. But the minute he leaves the house and becomes Jason Bourne, and he just lives off the grid for a quarter of a century? Maybe. I don't buy that. Um, he would need money to survive. With no official records. No criminal record. No crimes. On no lists ever. I don't think that's an easy existence. It's not to say it's impossible. I just don't see it as a likely one. Um, okay. Second possibility is that he's dead, right? Um, now, that, that one, I think, is also solid. Um, and I think it would be far more likely for him to still be in, in Japan, whatever his nationality was, but just to be a body by now, or bones, I guess, by now. Um, but let's take into account some things about him being dead, if he were dead. Um, for example, in Japan... If you abandon a body, that's a crime. It's a very serious crime. Uh, for people who are interested in, in in crime in that country, in Japanese crime, I would look into the case of Lucy Blackman. Um, there's a tremendous book called People Who Eat Darkness. And uh, People Who Eat Darkness is all about the Lucy Blackman case and the man who murdered her. Um, just a tremendous piece of work. And, and that kind of puts on display the way they catch the killer in the end, initially, was not for murdering her. It was for abandoning her body because they were like well maybe there's a chance that he wasn't actually the one who killed her but he definitely abandoned her body because he like buried her in a cement block and cut her head off and the rest of it so we'll get him on that and he's in jail for life so if somebody knew our killer and they knew he'd killed himself somewhere but did not report it they would be putting themselves at a big risk right because they would be getting in trouble um for for doing so for not reporting it right so that's so that's uh, important to mention um, and I can also tell you uh, another element. The chief um, requested, um, he, he went to the courts and uh, he asked for and was granted a perpetual ruling that all male unidentified bodies found in the nation of Japan are to be fingerprinted against the killer. And that's in, in, in per perpetuity. So until the guy is found, anybody that turns up, right? I imagine in 200 years, if they still haven't found it, they're not going to be doing it, right? But right. It, they, they mean it, right? So, so there's that. So it wouldn't just mean that if our guy was dead, it's enough for him to be dead. He has to have killed himself or died in a way where nobody knows about it and nobody's found a body. Now, that's not impossible, right? It's, it's definitely uh, possible, but it's been 24 years and nobody's found the body, nobody's found the bones. Um I would say that another further problem with him killing himself as, as an idea, my question would be why? Um, his actions in the house, to me personally, suggest a cold, calculated man, young man, who was carrying around uh, an inner rage. He had the, the, the wrath of God inside him, but he was cool and collected about where and when he was going to administer that anger and who he was going to do it to. So we see the way he strangles a child, drops the body. We see the way he kills the father, pushes him down the stairs, doesn't look at him again. We see the way he beats the teeth out of Nina, right? Mm -hmm. We see the way, you know, when the chief goes into the house and he, he sees Yasuko, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's graphic, but you know, her brain is coming out of her head. Oh, right. Wow. This this guy, mm -hmm. he she did not have a face. So, this guy I think is driven by rage. But once they're dead, he's not interested in them. So he turns it on, turns it off again. You're asking me if that guy would kill himself. Why? For what? But suddenly he develops a conscience. Suddenly he feels bad. So this is the kind of guy who's going to use their toilet. And, and eat their melon and so on and so forth. But then a week later, think actually what I did was really bad. Look, maybe. But, but I just don't think it follows with what we see he does in, in the house. Um, it brings us to the third possibility. Um, he, he's, he's not Jason Bourne and he's not dead. He's, he's alive. He's out there. He could be watching this video right now from the comfort of his home. Mm -hmm. and, and he simply left Japan. And that's all he had to do. Um, yeah. And if you have a way to leave Japan where they have no record of it, 
I'm not going to say it's the perfect crime because clearly it was very imperfect. But but what is the net result? The net result is 24 years and they have zero. So, okay, it's not perfect. But as far as these things go, you, you, you don't have the noose around your neck, right? So, so if I'm a betting guy, I'm going to tell you it's that last category. I, to me, I think he's still alive. Okay, let's talk about this knife that he brought. Okay, so bringing a sashimi knife as a weapon isn't ideal. What does this tell you about the killer? What does it tell us? Yeah, that's a good question again, man. Mm -hmm. um, I Look, potentially it tells us a lot, um, maybe, it, but also maybe not much. What we know about the knife is that it's um, it was not cheap. It was fairly high quality. Um so if he was 15, if he was a kid, then he's a kid who's getting like good pocket money, right? Um, or he doesn't buy him himself, but he's in a home where they have like decent stuff uh, lying around that he figures he can take without it being without it being missed too much, right? Um, we know that, you know, obviously the knife breaks the second he uses it. Right. First time he deploys the knife, it breaks, right? Now, um... You know that gives him injuries which uh which he carries around with him for life to this day you know the tmpd sound convinced that uh you know th those scars will be on him right now so if, you know i'm sure many of your viewers will know about locard's exchange principle right um and, and that's normally the killer going coming into contact with a crime scene and leaving something of themselves but taking something from the scene well in this case i think clearly one of the things he he takes as well as mickey or sweater and their money are these scars so that tells us he probably hasn't stabbed many people before number one based on the knife choice but also the way he uses it which immediately le leads to quite a bad injury okay so so i think um it tells us that he is uh, has a plan but maybe it is not the most kind of uh, well-traveled route, right? Maybe it's a plan, but it's only ever been a plan. Reading between the lines, I would say he's never done this before. Um, maybe he's been violent before, but in a way where it's never been on police record. It's probably never left a dead body behind. Um, I think it's important, if you go back and look at the images of the bag, zoom in and see what you see. What you will see is a small hole at the bottom of one of the ends of the bag. It's because the knife was too long. When right. you look at the measurements, the knife was too long, so it had to stick out a bit. So he does that. I think he wraps it in such a way, and that could explain why the police talk about the wrapping. I think maybe he didn't want it to poke out and be noticed, right? Um, that suggests stuff in itself. Uh, it suggests he is um, maybe using stuff where if the bag has a hole in it, it doesn't matter. Um, he's using clothes that if he has to dump them, it doesn't matter. So maybe he's using older stuff, um, although the jacket was brand new, but maybe he didn't plan to get blood on it and then figured once... There's blood on it. He has to leave it too. Um, but also, it, it suggests to me that that bag was his uh, it was kill kit. That, that was a kill kit, that bag. Um, and if it's a kill kit, then he has a plan. And if he has a plan, he has a reason to kill them, right? So, reason, the why that we mentioned right up top. We have lots of the what, the why. That is the beating heart of this Um the fact that the entirety of the TMPD doesn't even have a working theory, right? That FBI guy I mentioned, who was part of the Asahi TV documentary, he didn't want to. He didn't want to be on record, but he said to me, "Look, I will tell you, um, without getting into details, that they still think this is possibly a robbery gone wrong." And I told them that's crazy. This is not mm -hmm. a robbery. Same as the experts said, right? You go on their website, it's still listed as a robbery homicide. And it's true, he did rob them. He did take their money. So he took a, a sweatshirt as well. But I don't think that's why they're dead. It was not for that sweatshirt. It was not for that money. I think if he has a kill kit, he has a reason to kill them. And if I think you start leaning into what those reasons are, I mean, look, my best guess is that he ha has an internal rage that he decides to put onto the family like a like a sort of um surrogate victim right they not maybe are not necessarily the ones who pissed him off they are possibly not the people who crossed him or maybe they did in some small way 
but he was already carrying around this volcano inside him. And he figured, you know what? You're going to get it because you're vulnerable, because you're small, because you live in a house in a park, right? Because I know that I can kill you. And then day later, I can be drinking a Long Island iced tea on a beach somewhere in America, right? Um, what does the knife tell? Well, maybe all of this or maybe none of this, right? But I do think that it probably points towards um, a guy who had a plan and a guy who went there to destroy them. And I think he he went there to destroy them for his own personal reasons. I don't think he mm-hmm. gives a, I don't think he gives a flying fig about the police or anybody else. I think he went there for his own personal rage. Um, and then I think that the reason why it doesn't make sense to the TMPD is maybe because it's not meant to make sense, right? He figured, let's say it was uh, my boss who enraged me, but I can't kill my boss because if I do, there are consequences. Everybody I know knows I work for him. If, I, if he turns up dead tomorrow, they're going to start asking questions. But like strangers on a train, if I kill this family I don't know, I, I get I get my rage out, right? Maybe my boss hears about this and now he looks at me differently. He thinks, hey, maybe, maybe Billy could be the guy, right? Maybe I'm going to respect him from now on. Maybe I freak him out even. Who knows, right? Like I'm riffing. But I think he had his own personal reasons. And I think the reason why the TMPD can't get to him um, is because it doesn't make sense to them because it's not meant to make sense. Right. That's a guess up front. It's just the one that um, kind of I'm left with after 15 years. Yeah. Being that there's no connection between this person and the family could possibly be, as you would say, he's taking it out on something that reminds him of something else, right? Maybe exactly. his own family, right? He sees this beautiful nuclear family just living a beautiful life and he just, right. yeah. Wow. Right. Wow. That I just mean, look, went it, deep. <laughs> it, 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 as you say, you know, it could be that they are everything that was denied to him. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I worked um, with, I worked in kind of youth incarceration in California. And when you, when you, you know, some of these kids are carrying around a lot. And when you start probing, you, you know, like if I had had the, the experiences that you've gone through, Maybe I would have ended up doing what you did or worse, right? So mm-hmm. this is not to throw any stones uh, at anyone, um, but neither is it to let him off. Neither is it to like exculpate him, right? Um, what I would say is that it, it's entirely possible that he could have looked at this family and seen uh, the very love that he himself was denied. And he thought, well, I feel like breaking that. Why them and not me, right? So maybe they hadn't done anything wrong, but they had offended him just in the way that they existed. Or maybe it's got nothing to do with them. Maybe he simply, maybe they cut in front of him in line at the supermarket on a Tuesday. And he thought, you know what? I've been looking for some people. You'll do. You you know, look at the interviews of Ted Bundy. Why did you kill Sally? Why did you kill Sarah? Right. When you get down to it, I like the color of her hair. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, It's not a good reason. And yet he bashed her brains in. Right. So. I, I, like I say, it probably is never going to... We could find the guy tomorrow and he could tell us why. And I think, like Monks, even if he told us why, it probably still wouldn't make... It would be unsatisfying, whatever he said, because it would never solve this kind of paradox. Um, right. There's almost too much of the mystery for it to make sense at, at this point. Um, but I think what could explain this apparent disconnect between the extreme personal feeling of the murders versus the fact it doesn't seem like the evidence says there's any connection between them. I think it could be because he he had that rage inside him and he just chose to put it onto them, even if they didn't necessarily know him, which is crazy to us, right? But, but you know, stranger things have happened. Right. All right, this is, um, this is one that I'd like to know, and it's, um, can you tell me more about your conversations with Setsuko? As you said, she's 94 now, right? And yeah. that would be Mikio's mother and her relationship with Takeshi Tushita, the chief uh, at the time. Yeah, so I'll take that in reverse. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, so Chief Suchita, so it's important to say, he led this investigation uh, from Seijo Police Station. He was the, he was in charge of this. Um, I think he was a DNA guy or like a forensics guy um, before and then he kind of gets promoted and he ends up leading this case and he led it for many years. Um, And when he retired a few years ago, 
he um he's obviously outside the police station now but or the police force now but he um he's still very much involved and uh, he goes to see Setsuka I believe it's once once a month um yeah like we did a couple of in-depth interviews with uh, with Setsuka and uh you know it's 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 a really hard thing um I I pitched this as a podcast because I th I felt like it was important to bring the truth, um, or at least the story, um, out to a wider audience. It had been under my skin, and I wanted it to be under more people's skin. Um, so that was kind of intellectually, I knew what I was doing, and the rest of it. The minute you're looking into a 94 year old woman's eyes who has nothing, if if you look at if you look at her walls, you see calendars. And the day is going back 24 years are crossed off. You know what it is for a 94 year old woman to say, the only reason I haven't killed myself is because I want to know the truth. I want to know why. That was where it stopped being intellectual wow. for me and became, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, I know it's stupid. Maybe it sounds stupid, but it felt real. And, and it's difficult not to, not to cry when someone is, when you're looking into that much pain, it's like looking in, you know, into a black hole. Um, and when, so when she said, please, you know, find this guy, don't give up. Of course, you know, I swore that I wouldn't give up. So here we are, right? So we did those interviews. Um, and yet, you know, she's still, she's still smiling. You know, when you ask her to describe, when you ask her to describe Mikio, she lights up the room and she, you know, she's laughing. And, and it was just the most unbelievable um, strength, you know, I think I've ever seen in a person to go through that alone that you know at that age you know so so there were some things where i'm not sure if she fully understood and like i say there was some translation and the rest of it um so, which those inherent problems because japanese and, and and english aren't sort of easy bedfellows they don't sort of it's not like for like a lot of the times um so yeah she's um so she's friends with the chief and um and they like i say they see each other i think it's once a month she knows that this is this case is um chief's suchita's life his life's work she knows that um and so like i say he's retired but he really maintained uh, sort of activity in this space he set up a charity group called sora no kai and sora no kai is basically a kind of victim support group which didn't really exist in japan up until that point and and they're really important in this case and in other unsolved murders because they kind of pressed the government for law changes uh, not least of which was the statute of limitations on murder i think it was 20 years uh, before and then what happened amongst is that they appealed to to the central government to remove the statute of limitations for murder using this family as the kind of um, emblem of this movement and they won and they changed the law and they got rid of that law um so that victim support group, um, obviously, you know, Setsuko um, and the chief are very much kind of central there. Um, in terms of in terms of my relationship with uh, with with the chief, yeah, look, we're pals, basically. You know, um, he he sort of made me promise that I'm going to bring him a bottle of whiskey the next time I see him, um, whenever we. Whenever we're on Zoom, he always says about how handsome I am, which I'm just like, okay. It was funny the first time. It was like the third time now. So. But no, like he's a character. You yeah. Know, he's, a, he's a character. He's, um, he actually, in his spare time, I think he like grows potatoes. He like grows his own, uh, his own moonshine, which I don't know if I should share that. But, and he also <laughs> sings ballads, you know, like you can, you can, if you Google his name, he sings like romance ballads from back in the day. He's, he's a... Do a little, uh, do a little promotion for him there. <laughs> he has an album. <laughs> he has an album, man. Right. Out there. He's, he's not bad. He's kind of got good voice. Look, um, I think it's fair to, to, I think it's fair to say, like, despite my work, uh, you know, the subjects I write about in my novels and and my work in this podcast, I'm not like a huge fan of of cops as a rule. Um, but what I would say is that I think. He is. Uh, I've dealt with a lot of cops in my time in different ways, and and I think he is. Um, he, he's as well as being sharp, as well as being deeply smart. I think he's an honourable man, and I think he he genuinely does care. He really does. Like we can criticise uh, the people involved in this case any which way, 
but I would say that they have worked this case harder than I've ever seen anything else worked. And I think he was central to that. And he's still going on. He's in his 70s. Um, and we're still in touch about this. Not for not because he wants to be. You know, some like Spanish English guy makes a, a podcast on the other side of the world. Like he doesn't give a crap, right? But like mm-hmm. whatever helps, helps. So so yeah, we're kind of like pals by now, I would say. Um, and where we are with season one and maybe going into season two, I think he's essentially like, if you find something great, I'm in. So, so he's all in on any developments, um, wherever they kind of come from, if that makes sense. Yeah. Beautiful story. Thank I you. almost got teary eyed a little bit there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure if I was in the room, yeah. You said there was no dry eye in the room, right? We're talking a setsuko. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, mm-hmm. because here's the thing, like, you know, mm-hmm. you've got like a translator, there's like a sound mm-hmm. guy, you know, yeah, you've got recording, there's like cameras and stuff. Um, so on the one hand, it's kind of like an alien kind of artificial, not artificial, but like you, you, you kind of, you're working, right? Um, but it becomes very difficult to kind of stay professional when an old lady uh, sort of looks you in the eye and says, I, I have nothing, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like the, the kind of the figure of the lonely, sad grandmother, you know? It's like, what, what, what do you say, Right. you know? So you, you can only really say, look, uh, you know, I'm not going to give up. Like nobody called me up and said hey do you want to do you want to get you know involved in this case and it's not my business but but here i am man because i do genuinely believe um that for whatever reason um i ended up picking up that newspaper and reading about this family and going to that house and ending up writing a book and blah 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 why ever that happened it happened right and 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 if somebody else comes along tomorrow and can help more than me Right, I'm all in. Like I'm a naturally lazy person. I want to stay at home and write my books, right? <laughs> but but I promised that old lady that I'm not going to give up. So so that's where we are and and it's me because it's me and that's that, right? But like if I have the chance to look into this further and if a development comes up and and you know without getting into details let me just say that I don't think that's an impossible scenario. Um then I'm here to 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 do what that has to, to to do whatever it takes in order to see that to happen because this guy does not get to get he he does not get to ride off into the sunset he does not get to do this and to just say I'm on the other side of the world so you can't get me right so the safer option would have been just to make that podcast and leave it be um, but you know my grandmother says life is five minutes long so we're not we're not, we're not here for a long time right um. And I want to be able to get to her age, if I could get to Setsuko's age, which I don't think is likely, but if I am, and to, to be able to say, I didn't like just kind of go, shrug, what can I do? So I'm not going to stop with this man. You know, I'm really not. Um, and, and I hope that the break comes from somewhere, wherever it has to come from. Right. Um, but I do think if there's a chance that the break comes from outside of, outside of where I believe the TMPD are looking, if I believe they're not looking over there, I'm going to go over there. Um, yeah. So if that's with the chief's help, great. And if it's not too bad. I don't think there's a lot of, uh, stones left to be turned for you guys. Um, so it really does have to come from something maybe serendipitous in a sense, something that just happens to fall into the right person's ear. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's, uh, let's hope so, man. I mean, look, I think in, in the case of, um, in the case of the chief, it, it's a strange one because I think he's, um, you know, going back to him, I think he's maybe a little bit conflicted in that he, this like I say, this case means everything to him. Um, he was one of the first people to walk into that house and to look at those bodies, right? Um, and, and what he saw, he'd seen murders before, but what he saw, I think, he, he never unsaw it, right? Mm-hmm. It's in there for life. Um, so he's all in, like I say. And I do think he thinks whatever helps, helps. Right. Um, the, the the flip side is that um, I don't think he wants to bur- burn any former colleagues, right? Um, I don't think he wants to disrespect any of the current investigators, um, which, like I say, there's like 40 of them still. You imagine what it is to, to go over a 24-year-old case, mm-hmm. going over the same leads, the same phone call, so on, 24 years down the track. 
So I don't think he wants to burn any of them or disrespect any of them. Um, so I think me approaching him with other ideas or what about this or what about that technology or what if we go here, I think it kind of maybe puts him in a slightly awkward um, position. Um, but look, man, if it has to be awkward, it's going to be awkward. I don't care. You know, I'm, like I say, um, whatever it takes. Yeah. For Nicholas Obregon, he's going to be awkward. He has to solve <laughs> this case. <laughs> yeah, sorry, man. You know, any price. <laughs> yes. Um, so I don't know if you want to touch upon this guy. Um, I don't know how much weight he holds in the investigation, but it did come up as I was reading the Reddit, and I thought he was an interesting figure in a sense. Okay. And that is the uh, journalist Ichihasi, right? So oh, the other Ichihasi, yeah. The other Ichihasi, you know, and mm. I have a hard time understanding the man's motives or how he actually plays into this case. I mean, right. consider him a journalist, but you actually call him like a fan fictioner, <laughs> more or less, right? right? So <laughs> yeah. um, if you could explain him a little bit, and if you don't want to go in depth with this guy, then that's fine with me. Um. Yeah, so I really do. Uh, I, I don't respect this person a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I don't want to get sued by him, right? So, um, okay. yeah. what's the best way of saying this? Okay, so look, basically, as in far your as opinion, his, <laughs> my opinion, this is all just an opinion. <laughs> yeah. My opinion about the work he has done on this yeah. case, not about anything else, just on what he's written about this case. Um, I, for me, that doesn't hold any value, right? I think it is valueless what he mm -hmm. has done. Um, so, for, for people who don't know, this is this guy, uh, he's called Fumiya Ichihashi. It's not his real name. This is a, a nom de plume that he's made up, which, you know, how many investigative journalists do you know with a fake name? But okay. Um, he writes a book which basically um, is called something along the lines of like the, the truth about the Setagaya murders or something like that. Um, I forget the exact title. The, the, the story he writes or supposedly the truth he writes, um, it, it kind of reads like a like a Steve Larson novel. Like it's this big, sprawling, complicated conspiracy. But to boil it down to its simplest parts, he basically says that there is a Yakuza guy in Japan who is kind of working for the Unification Church, which is the Moonies, I think, um, and that they want the land where the Miyazawas live. Um, and so this Yakuza guy has to get that land and in order to get that land, he calls up um, a man called Mr. K. And Mr. K is a Korean Air Force man. But the Yakuza guy had like mentored him somehow. Um, and so the Mr. K owed the Yakuza guy like his life or he was his mentor or whatever. So when the Yakuza guy is like, hey, look, I need this land. Can you get rid of the family? Supposedly, they're like, Mr. K is meant to like, you know, stop being an Air Force guy in Korea, fly to Tokyo and, and to put the fear of God into the family to try and get them to leave. Um, but then supposedly it goes too far because it turns out that Mr. K is like, as well as being a, US, a, a Korean Air Force pilot, he's also an international hitman who flies all over the world, killing people and so on and so forth. Which already right there, right? You can see mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot, right? Um, it's got bells and whistles. Um, but, but that's not where it ends because he says that not only does he interview the Yakuza guy uh, in the book, not only that, but he also interviews Mr. K, who, why why would he talk to him, I guess? But but he actually meets him in his car and he says he actually lifts this guy's fingerprints um, and he goes so far as to suggest he gives them to the TMPD for them to match and that for whatever reason they don't want to admit the truth, which is Mr. K is the, is the real killer. Um now, I will say that when, without mentioning any names, when I when I put this forward to um, law enforcement, you know, what about this guy? What about his his the truth about the Setagaya case and his theory? Um, I, I'll say that there was kind of scornful laughter in the room, and then the kind of suggestion that this man was not helping, right? So if you ask me why someone would, I'm not saying that this is what this guy has done, but generally, if you ask me why someone would do this, I think to cash in to mm. make money. Right. I think that's why. Now, it's also worth saying that I, um, 
I repeatedly asked Mr. Ichihashi if he would come on my podcast um, where I could scrutinize his theories. I asked him several times. Uh, he said, no, he, he couldn't do that because it would put his sources at risk. And I said, okay, Mr. Ichihashi, well, let's do it anonymously then. I won't ask you about any of your sources. No, 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 I can't do that. I can't do that. Um, some people have said in Japan that it's not even one guy. They've said it's a collection of journalists who spin wild tales under a fake name to make a bit of extra cash. I'm not saying it. I'm just saying that's what some people have said. Um, he basically, he ducked me. He ducked mm -hmm. me a bunch of times. Um, I think maybe he realized that I would be scrutinizing his ideas. So look, I'll, I'll let your viewers decide. Um, and again, I, I want to be careful here because I don't want to get in trouble uh, with him. Um, but look, let me say it this way. I'm a crime novelist, right? As we've mentioned, I write, I make up crime stories to kind of, you know, to ask the reader questions about human nature. That's mm -hmm. that's the 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 vehicle which I, I use in order to do that, right? But I make up stories. Um, and I'm just speaking again generally here, but I would say the idea of writing a book with a bunch of wild theories about a real family who were really killed, um, to me, that feels like basically doing the same job that I do. The difference is that when my readers read my books, they're not told this is the truth, okay? And I think that's an important difference. So, um, yeah. Hopefully, I'm not going to jail now the next time I go back to Japan. But yeah, I, I, I would just say to people, if you read that book, um, you know, I, really do your own research if you're going to read that book and assume it's the truth. And it's frustrating to me when you hear people online say, well, this guy said this and this journalist said that. It's based on zero. Absolutely zero. Yeah. At least that's what law enforcement told me. Yeah, like most cases that go unsolved for long years and decades and whatnot, mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of landmines <laughs> out right, there, right, right. misinformation right. or whatnot. So we're going to end the interview on this simple question. Uh, okay. Do you want to address some of the, you know, misconceptions about this case or debunking any egregious, you know, falsehoods? Like one I'll give you an example of was uh, there is a lot of stories saying that the phone line was cut, right? Yeah, yeah. But that that isn't true. Uh, I got that yes, from your Reddit post. Touched. Yeah, yeah. The phone line was never touched. Um, yeah, you know, uh, uh, you know, this is a good time to say that I really do appreciate you doing this because I've wanted to for a while have this opportunity because obviously, you know, I'm I'm kind of in this space around this crime, and I, I you know I've I've typed this stuff stuff out a million times, so I, I do appreciate that opportunity to be able to kind of meet these ideas head on. Um, the phone line was untouched. He never touched the phone. Um, he used the internet for about five, or he used the computer for five minutes. That's it. Um, I think the main, there are a whole bunch of these, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think the main one is the idea that he's um, mixed race, right? Okay. I mean, yeah. look, it, it's um, essentially, right? This goes back to Dr. M. And this is really important. Because like like the earlier uh, question, I can't remember who it was. Um, might have been Ali, but or Ally. But the question was: Was genealogy ever done outside of uh, outside right. of Japan? For example, in the U.S., this is a really important topic. Doctor M, his lab was approached by the TMPD for a second opinion. He's deeply respected in 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 Japan. Like I say, he's kind of high up in the world of forensics. Um, he didn't want to be in the podcast, but we did talk. Or Ryushi spoke to him. Um, the TMPD approached him for a second opinion. In the process of him giving that second opinion and doing the analysis on the killer's forensic material, somebody at his lab leaks that information. Okay? Um, but what they leak seems to be the preliminary results. So I don't know if it's some intern who sees that Dr. M has written up some preliminary notes and says, oh, this is what the conclusion is, and then leaks that to the press. Um, but the only reason that we know anything about this online, about the, the killer's background, um, is because of this leak. Now, Dr. M said that information was basically misunderstood from the beginning, okay? That, you know, because that information was misunderstood, he was saying, well, there's a possibility that X, but people 
when that information was leaked and saying, oh, he's mixed race, X, right? He was just saying there was a chance. There is a reason why the TMPD say nothing about the killer's ethnicity on their website. They do not mention it. They approached Wikipedia and asked them to take down the details they have on their Wikipedia. You know, don't get me started on the Wikipedia pages because they are a real dumpster file. Yeah. Um, and this is not intentional misinformation, but they're just pulling old articles, right? Including some old stuff I wrote about the case years ago when I didn't know anything about it and saying, well, that's the source. So if they're doing that with me, they're doing that with a bunch of other. Um, and also when you go on the Japanese translation, sometimes it will say, okay, source number one, and you click on number one, it just says the Asai Shimbun from the year 2004, January, but there's no link to anything. So, so all of us could say, well, you know, the moon is made of cheese. And I read that in the New York times last February, right? That's not a source. Um, but they wouldn't take down the information about the killer being mixed race because, um, they said, we want a court order. Well, the TMPD weren't going to do that. So look, essentially, what that what Dr. M said um, is that there is a one in four chance that the killer is Korean, a one in 10 chance that he um, was Chinese, and a one in 13 chance that he's Japanese. Um, he also suggests the possibility that on the mother's side that the killer had some Mediterranean ancestry. Right. Now... Again, people hear that and they go, oh, so he's half Mediterranean and half Korean, okay? They automatically, two and two is five. But here's the thing, mitochondrial DNA, right, could be looking at the killer's grandmother being from Spain or Portugal or Italy, but it could be the grandmother times 25. And, and now we've gone back to the times of Marco Polo. So a grandmother 600 years ago being Portuguese, 600 years later, you don't look Portuguese. So, so that's essentially useless, uh, is what I'm saying, in terms of us trying to picture a man today. Right. Um, so all of this, that when when we read in this case that he is ethnically X, Y, Z, I'm here to tell you, we do not know that definitively. We do not know what he looks like other than he had short hair at the time, which was dark, and we know roughly he was about five foot seven, five foot eight, and he had a size 10 shoe and a size 29 waist, I believe it was. Right. So again, just to, I know I'm laboring the point, but wherever you see the killer was mixed race, this is not a fact. This is only a possibility. Um, the earlier question mentioned about the genealogy or his family tree. Nobody's looked at that. As I say, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be legal uh, in Japan. And uh, and again, the, the, there are there are no databases in which to do that. But I think, yeah, if you're asking me, like, what's the biggest misconception about the case? I think it's that he was mixed race. That's not to say there isn't a chance he was Korean. I think there probably is. And I think Dr. M's preliminary results, nobody else has looked at them outside of the TMPD, right? And they were his findings. So I'm not saying this is unlikely, but I'm just saying let's not draw hard and fast conclusions when we cannot do that based on a leak from 24 years ago. The guy who came up with the results didn't want it out there either. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, like there are a lot of them. Um, but off the top of my head, that's kind of like the main one. I don't know how you're doing for time. If you want me to like go on the Wikipedia page and shoot down the other ones, or or if we're uh, if you got if you got more on the line, I'd love to hear it. If you want to debunk a lot, because yeah, this this misinformation could lead people down the wrong tracks. I'm sure as that sure man. Um, okay, let me scroll through. Right, so you, you, you load up the Wikipedia page and like third paragraph, it says right there, right? The killer entered through the open window of the second floor bathroom. So right there, boom, as a fact. Right. It doesn't say there is a chance. It doesn't mm. say this is one of the theories. It said he did. You see what I'm saying? And I'm here to tell you the TMPD don't know that's how he did it. It says he climbed up a tree, right, to remove the window screen. BS, he didn't climb up the tree to do that. The tree's further away than the fences. He went, yes. if he did that, he went to the fence first. He climbed up the air conditioning box and then he got to the window like that. So you see like that's within two sentences, right? And then when you click on um, the actual sources, right? Like number seven, you hit that and it loads up a newspaper and it's like from 2001. So it's not to say that that guy was wrong, but those are the initial assumptions from 2001 early days 
early days and they're, and they're here 23 years later saying this is still still what the deal is it's also important to say that um it's important for your viewers to know that the way press works in japan when it comes to crime reporting is that there is a, there's a thing called the kisha club and the kisha club is essentially a press club within the police what that means is you have to be in the club in order for them to give you like interviews and stuff in order for them to kind of uh, drip you know feed you info about the case uh, you're either inside or you're outside and if you're inside the expectation is these detectives you're going to take them out to dinner you're going to take them out to the bar you're going to get them drunk you're going to keep them sweet maybe you give them little gifts or whatever but you see the inherent problem right with with you know, sort of rewarding the guy for information are you going to be the same person who then scrutinizes his work if it turns out he's corrupt or if it turns out he made a mistake? Right. So the system, again, this is not a criticism of, of Japan. This is what the system is. But you see, right, is that guy in the year 2000, right, in 2001, how much is he going to say, well, hold on, you said it was the window, but this other guy is saying it had to be the front door. You know, how much pushback is there? And I think kind of the, the, the beating heart of, of a strong, solid um, press is that kind of press scrutiny. That's, you know, people sometimes think information just falls down from a cloud. Um, th this is a job and it's a difficult job and, you know, it has to be done. Someone has to ask awkward questions. But right there, first paragraph on the narrative of the case, wrong. Like, maybe he went through the window, but here it's stated as, as a fact, right? Um, you run on a little bit. Mikio rushed up the first floor stairs after this, after detecting uh, a disturbance, right? Bullshit. I'm sorry, I don't know. I right. probably can't swear. But bull no, no. crap. Please. Right? <laughs> we don't know he detected anything. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, if we turn it around, the person writing this, how do they know there was a disturbance? Based on what evidence? Who substantiates that disturbance? Right? You see what I'm saying? Like, literally, first paragraph, right? And, and you notice as well, um, you know, no source whatsoever for that individual statement. Um, you know, you roll on. The killer remained in the house for, for two to ten hours. I think that one has been changed quite recently. Um, yeah, and if you look at the source, it's gone to an article, um, you know, from, from 2020. So that's a more recent source. Um, he used the family computer, so he consumed four bo bottles of barley tea, so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah and taking a nap on the sofa in the second floor living room. Based on what? How do we know this man didn't just lie down on the sofa mm -hmm. and he was just, you know, reading a newspaper? How do we know he wasn't counting sheep or reciting poetry to himself? They don't know this stuff. I, I, have, I have taken stuff in this case at face value too. I have read in the past, he slept on their couch uh, and, and figured, oh, I guess he slept on the couch. Then you start speaking to the people involved. Based on what? So, like, you don't have to scan long and hard into this article to, to, to be left with a frustration that people are now building up this kind of Goldilocks image of this guy. So right. I imagine being so relaxed around four dead bodies that you would just go to sleep. We don't know he went to sleep, right? Um, an analysis of the computer revealed it had connected to the internet the morning after the murders at 1.18 a.m. and then again around 10 a.m. What did I say earlier on? He didn't connect at 10 a.m. It was the grandmother waking the computer up, right? He connected at 10 a.m. around the time Yasuko's mother, Haruko, entered the house and discovered the murders, okay? So so now they're trying to suggest that, like, he was there seconds before Haruko came in and he just right. went out the window just before. You, you see what I'm saying? Again, bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like, based on what? So this is kind of part of, like, and, and like I say, this is the English language one. If you go into the Japanese language one, where the, where the sources are even shakier, because there's been a lot more writing and, and theorizing and blogging about this case in Japan for obvious reasons than in the English language, then their one's even more of a dumpster fire. And this is not to rag on Wikipedia editors. This is not to rag on Wikipedia itself. You know, it's a valid resource and, and, it, and it's useful in the rest of it. But in this particular page, I have problems with it. Yeah. Um, I'm not expecting the people who write this to know as much as I know because they obviously haven't investigated it to the degree I have. Like, I'm not, it's not reasonable to expect that. But it's just frustrating people write something without a source as if it's a fact, 
and then millions of people go out and form this idea of the guy, which is only halfway there, if you know what I'm saying. Um, here we go, like you said. Right. Haruko became suspicious after being unable to call her daughter. Brackets, the killer had unplugged the phone line. Right. Yeah, where? Mm-hmm. Literally, the chief, I said to him, just to confirm, he did, he left the phone alone. The phone line was fine. Okay, let me just ask you again. He did not cut the phone line. He said, no, that's based on nothing. The phone line was fine. So like within two two paragraphs, we've right. got like three or four misunderstandings or just outright fabrications. So like we could go through this, um, but like I'm just going to track ahead to um, one, one, one important thing to mention, I, I would say is the Jizo statue. So April 9th, 2001 so sort of like you know a few months after the murders um this kind of buddhist statue was placed kind of opposite the house or to the west of the house um 100 days after the murders and the theory suggests this is what they're saying on the wikipedia page that someone who was involved may have placed it there i don't have a problem with the may because it because it's not confirmed um what i would say is that somebody feeling guilty enough to heft a big stone statue um, close to the house um it was also marked with the with the number six on the actual statue itself and some people have suggested that number six corresponds to ray's age because he was six years old at the time of the murders i don't have strong opinions on this but i would say there is zero evidence linking it to the killer zero okay. evidence but that did happen though someone left it the did statue. happen there was a, D- mm-hmm. a Jizo statue left but there was zero trace of the killer on it and they haven't been able to track track down the owner or whoever left it there okay um the the article says he may have placed it there so so i'll let that slide because that's 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 true um okay investigators found dna and fingerprints blah 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 fine again another misunderstanding they estimate the killer to be to have been 15 to 35 years old at the time of the incident initially their first guess i believe was 15 to 40 which is like, how long is a piece of string? That's like millions of people, right? Right. Um, not 35. However, I think it was in 2020 or 2019, the TMPD actually released a press um, briefing that they've revised the killer's age down to 15 to 24. Um, so the Wikipedia article misses that completely. That was on the national news in, in Japan. Um, he's Taipei blood, fine. Here we go. This is where it gets good. A DNA analysis of type A blood determined the killer is male and possibly mixed race, possibly, fine, with maternal DNA indicating a mother of European descent, possibly from a South European country near the Mediterranean or Adriatic Sea, and paternal DNA indicating a father of East Asian descent. So you see here, you read that, you think, oh, okay, so the mum was, so the mum was sort of maybe, maybe from South, Southern Europe and the dad's East Asian, right? Like I say, it is possible but we do not know he's mixed race. If your grandmother was from Portugal 500 years ago, if we're looking at a photo of you today, that Portuguese uh, ancestry is useless. You're not gonna look Portuguese, whatever that means, you know know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Holding hands with that is the stuff about the chromosomes. Um, It is considered possible that European maternal DNA comes from a distant ancestor. So here, at least it does say distant as a possibility rather than a fully European mother. And then it talks about his uh, chromosomes. And then it talks about Dr. M's uh, analysis that it could appear in one in four Koreans and so on and so forth. These results led the TMPD to seek assistance through um, the ICPO um, as the killer may not be Japanese or present in Japan. So look, all of that's to say, like, this is kind of half of it's true, half of it's misunderstood or just plain wrong. But but when you when you kind of, when the paragraphs go on and on and on, that kind of effect of, I don't want to say misinformation because that sounds intentional, but, but that's the, the, the result. Um, it grows and grows and grows. This is another misunderstanding right here. The, the investigation into the murders is the largest in Japanese history involving over X amount of investigators. That number is actually wrong. It's grown since this was written and collected over 12,000 pieces of evidence, which sounds like a crazy number. Um, And people go, well, how can you have collected 12,000 pieces of evidence? You haven't caught the guy. 
I think that number also includes the boxes in the house of the stuff belonging to the family. So what's been used, the word evidence is used here, but I think that might also include stuff that had nothing to do with the murders, but it was in the house that they had to pack up. So obviously they went through every single book or dress or shoe or whatever, every little trinket. And then when they realized it had nothing to do with the murders, they put it in a box. It sounds like they're counting those as well, but there are not 12,000 pieces of evidence left individually by the killer. Mm. Right. Unless you're talking about like every drop of blood is one, second drop of blood is two, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but but you see what I'm saying here, monks. That like that the accumulative, the, the cumulative effect of um, these kind of, you know, th these these articles, especially when they're written by different authors all at the same time, it kind of adds up a picture which is inaccurate, and mm. that's frustrating because then that inaccuracy breeds more inaccuracy and so on and so on and so on ad infinitum um and and you end up with a kind of a misunderstanding about this case which is a real a real frustration um for me personally because obviously i'm i'm sort of i've got my head in it um and actually yeah one one thing i do think it is important to say is at the end here it mentions may 27th the setagaya ward assembly passed a motion for tokyo to use dna evidence and promote its use, including expansion of DNA information. When they say Tokyo, they're talking about the government there. Um, so, like I say, maybe you know that's a sort of hopeful place to leave Wikipedia. It, it, that's it's something is something, and 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 like I say, like I think one of the questions kind of mentioned the the thing about DNA and like you know why 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 don't they do something with the DNA? Well, obviously I explained about the legal reasons um, why they can't. Um, but I, but I do think just there's something I didn't mention earlier on, but it's occurred to me now that's worth mentioning. Um, I do think that there is an ethical debate to have about the DNA itself, right? Cause it seems like it's a, it's an open and shut thing. We have his DNA. Why don't we investigate him by using the DNA? But it's not that simple, right? There's a very sort of simplified way of, you know, it's easy to say, but what does that actually mean when we're talking about changes of law and possible erosion of uh, privacies and, and freedoms, right? Like, on the one hand, I do think it's true that the, the killer, in a way, almost has his DNA protected. His privacy is respected, whereas the Miyazawas have none, right? The, the, the reason that you and I are having this conversation is because they have no privacy, because he took that from them. Um, and that seems morally bankrupt, right? That seems morally abhorrent. Um, it is the worst unsolved uh, series of murders in Japanese history. And potentially they're sitting on, on the golden egg and, and it's not going to hatch. Um, so on the one hand, we could we could say, you know, as, as, the, as the user mentioned, as the viewer mentioned, like, how can that make sense? And I do get that for sure. And I feel it too. Um, on the other hand, as I mentioned, Japanese police have a lot of power. Um, there is not appetite to give them more so far as I see it. And they also do not have a murder rate, which really justifies giving them extra powers, right? When, when you have a essentially negligible murder rate, it's hard to make the argument, listen, we've got to start taking this seriously, right? Because family murders like this, it's the Miyazawa's and that's it, right? There's a handful of other comparable cases in Japan. So it's not like there is that same pressing need as the way there was in the US. Hey, listen, new technology comes out, we've got thousands of cold cases to solve, we've got to start leaning into it. Um, because I think it is important to say that there is the other side to doing this would be the, the, the kind of, the discomfort in giving law enforcement yet more power when I wouldn't necessarily trust them with that um, in Japan or the US or the UK or anywhere else for that matter. I don't think it's as open and shut as just saying, even if we could change the law, could we just, press the button. I think it has to go to a vote. I think it has to be, as you say, you know, something for the people to, to consider. Um, when you take into account in Japan, their conviction rate being on par with North Korea or any dictatorship, um, when you take into account the fact that they can hold you for 23 days on one single charge, giving them more powers on top of that. I'm not sure it's so sort of black and white, but um, so all that to say, I think maybe on that last point of DNA. If there is a solution here um, on the DNA front, I think maybe it's that you, you, you make a legal change in very specific, exceptional cases such as this. 
that you, you allow the police to use DNA um, databases abroad in very limited cases such as this. Maybe that's the way forward for Japan. Um, so in your video, when, when you said, you know, and like I say, what chimed with me is, is the part about uh, looking forward, looking to the future, looking to an outcome. Um, maybe the way in which we get there, at least on the DNA front, is in a limited um, capacity, starting with this family. Um, there are a handful of others, um, other murders in Japan that also deserve this, um, that also need this. Um, they're, they're connected to that group, Sora no Kai, in fact. But I would say that maybe that's the solution. Not like a wholesale change, not like this is what we do now for all cases, but a car that's stolen or whatever. But in cases of murder, there is no statute of limitations. In cases of murder, let's make the argument we can use, uh, you know, familial uh, genealogy, um, you know, whatever it might be, uh, in order to find this guy. Because look, I'm happy the Golden State Killer got caught too. But when you think about the police making fake profiles uh, based on DNA uh, from decades ago, pretending to be Uncle Bob in order to find Cousin Sally so that you can link Cousin Sally to the guy in your murder. On paper, that's great. Um, but what if they start abusing that, right? What if, what if they start doing that? Um, what if they get it wrong? There are all, you see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not here to say it's bad or good. I'm just saying that I think there's a debate. And I think if this goes forward, Japan needs to have that debate. And I think that's what that um, Setsugai Award vote is kind of asking for, as opposed to just change the law right now, let's catch the guy, you know? So I, I just hope that if we get there, we get there um, soon enough for Setsuko to see. But I'm just not going to hang around uh, for that day. In the mm -hmm. meantime, I'm going to do my best um, to see if there are other ways around that. Yeah. Hey, Nicholas, you made a promise to a 94-year-old woman in Japan, and you're keeping it, eh? Hey? I'm keeping it, man. <laughs> Kudos. <laughs> you can't break it to the granny. <laughs> All right. We could end it on this. And I'm telling you, this was an amazing conversation. There was just a wealth of information that people could use you know going forward maybe somebody will go ahead and change that wikipedia that has the power to do so and uh yeah we'll get it out there and anything that you'd like to plug uh for these people um uh, to to get to better know your you know your your writings um well look yeah first of all just to say i really appreciate your time monks and i appreciate this chance i've been looking for something like this so so i'm grateful to that and i hope your viewers um find this useful um because i think it is important to for, for the people if you are going to engage with this case like engage with it um knowing that it's not always as as simple as you know as the wikipedia page suggests right. um i would say look if any of you are interested in this case or want to know more or maybe there's a few things where you kind of feel like weren't fully explained um check out my podcast on this case it's sort of seven eight episode deep dive it's the only one that I know of on this case um, with interviews of actual people connected to this case, family, law enforcement, so forth. It's called Faceless. You'd find that in the usual places. Um, it was award winning. Bronze award, you know, full disclosure. It wasn't, you know, always the bridesmaid, but, you know, it's award winning technically nonetheless. Um, in terms of me, um, if you have a curiosity of my sort of day job, um, just Google uh, Nicolas Obregón, Nicolas Obregón um, books. They'll they'll come up. I have a, a series of um, dark but poetic uh, detective novels, crime novels about a Japanese American detective and um, Jeffrey Deaver himself, um, the great crime fiction name, called one of them a masterpiece. So who am I to to argue with him, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So you Google me, you'll find my stuff. And if you listen to the podcast. I appreciate it and if you want to read my books i appreciate that too and and but but most of all um you know engaging with this case because as you said in your video um we we can't just let this get cold we can't just leave it there and every click every every google search every kind of minute spent thinking about it is to the good um and hopefully um it, it will sort of you know one pair of eyes will connect with this video or whatever Maybe they know a guy, maybe they saw something, maybe they were in Japan, who knows, man. Like, But, um, so yeah, this was a pleasure for me, man. And, uh, it was a pleasure for me, and thank you so much for your time, all the way from Spain. It's getting it's late Spain. over there for you. Yeah, look, it's 10 o'clock, it's, it's dinner time for me now, you know. Oh, so. wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, it's no, look, maybe, there, maybe there'll be a chance to, um, you know, who knows, there are developments. Um, 
in the case. We could talk about this again. You know, touch I would wood. love to. Yes, touch wood. Um, mm-hmm. And whether that means the guy gets found or whether that just means there's a new direction in the case, whatever it might be, um, we'll 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 stay in touch, man. Yeah, you'd have to change the name of the podcast if they find him, right? Yeah, yeah. He has, a, has a face now. Yeah, he has a face. Yeah, be like, you know, the, the killer the man with, with a face. face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know if it has the same ring. <laughs> All right, we've gone off the rails. 